at inductive sources, and uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about the basic experiment. We went through the time domain, both from the point of view of uh, vertical magnetic dipole over uh, like a 1D Earth. Uh, had a case history, actually we had two case histories. And now I want to do the same thing in the frequency domain. So the, the concept of frequency and time is basically the same. So many things are going to look very similar. So I think we can go through pretty quickly. So with adaptive sources in the time domain, remember we just have this transient and then we get this uh, okay. In the frequency domain, we get a magnetic field that is still sinusoidal and Got its own amplitude and phase. Let's first look at what happens over half space. Again, we've got a vertical magnetic dipole, and our half space is 100 ohm meters. The current density uh, that's induced uh, in, in the Earth, again, is that circular pattern. So the, the transmitter is, is circular, so the currents are going to be circular. So you've got stuff that's coming into the board and out of the board. Uh, in this case, we plotted the, ab the uh, absolute value, so that's why they're yellow. Uh, looking at the magnetic flux, here's co highest concentration magnetic field is right in the middle. And effects of frequency, remember, <coughs> for now we have skin depth. So as the uh, frequency decreases, okay, we're going to see deeper. So at 100 kilohertz, this is where the currents are confined. At uh, 10 kilohertz, you can see how the currents are getting deeper and uh, using it. In the so we have the same principle that we have as a function mm -hmm. of time. Uh, that <clears throat> as the lower the frequency, the greater the skin depth, and the deeper the penetration. If we go to layered Earth, again, we're going to do exactly the same thing that we had before. Uh, this layer in here, uh, we're going to make progressively, well, it's going to first of all resistive, and then we're going to make it conductive. So here we are at, uh, at 100 ohm meters. Uh, this is what the currents uh, look like. If we make it 1,000 ohm meters, we put that that half resistive layer in here at 1,000 ohm meters, then we can see that we really haven't altered things very much. The currents are still pretty much up there, and we're actually seeing down to go up. This is a little bit more difficult to see than the time domain results, but the, uh, things are still the same. If we put a conductive layer in, then there's a lot of currents that are in that conductive layer, and there's still some in that near surface. And if we make that layer really quite conductive, then most of the currents are actually... So exactly the same kind of thing that we had in, in the time domain. And there was the magnetic fields again plotted in this way, just to, just to kind of show you how the magnetic fields actually vary. And remember, we're going to be at a receiver that's sitting on this little bit of top. <laughs> the sounding curves are the ones that are particularly interesting. If we have a just a background resistivity of 100 ohm meters, uh, then here's the real and the imaginary part. So remember, the sounding curve for time domain was just a single curve, but now here we've got real and imaginary parts. So we actually have two, two curves. If we put a resistor layer in. Uh, there's really not very much difference. So with the resistive layer, we get this dashed line. And uh, there is change, but not, not huge. Whereas if we put a conductive layer in, then the here was the references. And now look at the difference between <laughs> with the conductive layer and without, both for the imaginary and the spectrum. And then if you make it one ohm meter, it's, uh, it's huge. So now let's come back to the shielding problem, remember? So that was the thing that torqued us off to start with. In DC receivity, we couldn't see through that. But now in, in this, 
inductive process, uh, we already know what to expect, right? What's going to happen? <clears throat> Daniel? What about deep current? <clears throat> yeah, so now we, if, if we've got this resistive layering, which really killed us when we were doing the DC resistivity, now if you look at what happens here, so this just refreshes your memory on what the resistive layer is. So without the layer, you've got something that looks like this. With the layer, we've got the currents up here, high apparent resistivity, and take the uh, cylinder out, and we still get the same result. So we're completely shielded. Now if we have the EM case, without any resistor up here, this is what we have. So we've got currents up here, and we've got currents on the, on the sphere. Right? So we're, we're illuminating that sphere. We put that resistive layer in, that's what we got. So we are completely invisible to this. It just doesn't make any difference. We've got the same, basically the same currents here as we have here. So this pic, these two pictures look identical. So with the resistive layer, without a resistive layer, there's no difference. So that is the huge fundamental difference between how a galvanic system works with DC resistivity compared to an inductive system. And just to show if you took that uh, <laughs> cylinder out, then, then this is where the current is. <clears throat> and if you look at the, at the, at the sounding curves, then with the, with the sphere here, uh, that's these pluses up here, and with the sphere and the resistivity, or and that resistive layer, that's the dash. You can see that those sounding curves look essentially identical. I was going to say that's why cooking with an inductive filter top works so well. Exactly. You can put a towel down and have the pot sitting on top of it. Exactly. <clears throat> maybe, maybe we should advertise, somehow put that in the title. <laughs> <laughs> So what about a conductive layer? So in DC resistivity, we ended up, it, it kind of channeled the current in here, and that screened us from that. So what's going to happen here? So now we're going to use our EM system. We should. Won't see what it's Pardon me? We will not see anything. So if we, without any conductive layer, this is what we see. <clears throat> With the conductive layer, we don't see anything down here. All of the currents are in here. So it comes into the conductor, absorbs all the energy, all the currents are there. And that, that's all we see. So let's do a, uh, a case history on uh, using this. This is a... Uh, case history that comes from Australia. And basically it's the following. They, so here's the area here. Uh, so there's a Murray River that runs like this. This region up here is all elevated. It's uh, at, at high elevation. There's a lot of irrigation. And that irrigation causes uh, fertilizer salts to go down slope onto a floodplain down here. Uh, there's salt accumulation, it destroys the vegetation, you can see that's gone on here, and is causing uh, a, a problem. In fact, if you went down onto that river area, this is what the, uh, the region looks like, so there's just huge, huge amounts of salt. So right now, what's happening is that with all these salts coming down, uh, the floodplain is being salinized. It's really causing a lot of ecological damage. 
So what they wanted to do was to do an experiment. In fact, there's still this is still an ongoing experiment that is happening. And they wanted to see what could be done from the point of view of reclaiming things. So the question is now, how would you possibly reverse these actions that are happening? And what they thought they'd do is twofold. One is to build some wells here and then pump water out to drill the well, pump water out, so that's saline water, and then put it onto a storage pond up top, <clears throat> and then it evaporates. So that kind of gets rid of salt water that way, and hopefully fresh water from the river would kind of come in to uh, replace the salt water. Uh, the other thing is that they could also inject uh, fresh water in, in some region and try to kind of push the salt water up. So that's kind of what they did. Uh, got injection wells here, and then they've got a region in here where they're going to inject fresh water, and then they're going to monitor things as a, as a function of time. What you're seeing up here in 2006, they did a DC resistivity survey ac across here and got the electrical resistivity profile, and that's shown up here. So the blue is very resistive, basically that's fresh water, and the red is quite conductive, uh, that's basically salt water. So after they did this experiment of pulling up here and putting water in here, then they redid that uh, DC resistivity experiment. And you can see how far in the, uh, the blue extension is, so that means that there's fresh water that's, that, that's <clears throat> going in. Here. And uh, yeah, so it looks like it's, it's kind of made it a difference, so that there is some potential for perhaps moving that, that, that salt water. Uh, on the other hand, clearly what they need to do is to have some way of monitoring what is happening here as a function of solidity. <laughs> <clears throat> so that says, oh, well, maybe we should do a, an EM survey because we've got these large electrical um, resistivity contrasts between fresh and saline water. So the saline water has got maybe three to five uh, sequence per meter. The fresh water is, is really low, and uh, that's really going to be the diagnosis. <coughs> so they're going to do a survey. In fact, they did a couple of surveys. They did a sky temp survey, which was a time domain, uh, but they also did a resolve system, which is a frequency domain. And uh, here's the resolve system. I've kind of shown you this a little bit before. Uh, it's got horizontal coplanar coils in it. Uh, so here's your transmitter and here's your receiver. And then there's uh, five different frequencies, anywhere from 400 hertz to about 130,000 hertz. And uh, yeah. yeah, the lines were flown in this in, in this direction here. But here's a slide that uh, I, I really like to show at, at this time uh, because it uh, I think it's an opportunity for people who are here to kind of recalibrate and get a metric for you know what they learned since 8 o'clock this morning, or whenever we started. And so you might think, I'm not going to ask you, but you might think uh, what you would have, would have thought if I had presented you, or if you were presented with this slide at 8 o'clock this morning. What things would have resonated? What things would have made some sense? Uh, where would you have been if I had shown you that slide at 8 o'clock this morning? If you do that, then you can also figure out how much you've actually learned in that subsequent time. Because if we look at this, I mean, first of all, what we see is horizontal coplanar data, so you already know, okay, that's 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 two loops that have been uh, right here on, or on plane. We've got ratio of secondary to primary <coughs> magnetic field, which now means something to you. Uh, We've got in phase and we've got quadrature phase. You now understand those. We've got frequencies here. So here's frequency of 380 hertz. Here's 36,000 hertz. So you know that this is a map 
of data that's somehow reflecting deeper structure. This is the shallower structure. And here's a, uh, here's a dot. Here's a response curve. The, the sounding curve that we have from this dot here looks like this. And we've got a response curve over here. But these things now actually make some sense to you. We talked about this as being you know, the response curve from a general frequency domain system. And if we look at this and we try to make a relationship with this, uh, perhaps try to make, uh, see if, if this, this kind of makes some sense and of how it does connect with it. And I think probably what you're seeing is that, oh, I've got this response curve. This is induction number here. So it's like going up in frequency. And here we've got something that's going up in frequency. And this is my response, OK? But look how things are going. On the lower frequencies, the in phase is progressively small, and it continues to increase. And the quadrature phase, the imaginary part, decreases. So that means that we must be on this side of the response curve, right? Because as we go up in frequency, <coughs> And the real part is increasing, and the imaginary part is decreasing, which is just like this, which is telling us, like, okay, we're on a, uh, we're, we're on over a very highly conducting region here, and these things are actually making some sense. So, we look at all of this, this information, and we see, yeah, there's, uh, you know, really substantially high Conductivity is coming in these regions, uh, particularly at, at depth, and we're you know, starting to look at that and it's meaningful. That's always nice. If somebody can show you a picture and you look at it and you see a whole bunch of things on there that like, you resonate with and you understand, uh, not only does that make you feel better, but also increases your ability to get good information from who's ever offering that to you, right? Because as soon as you show some indication that you actually know what you're talking about, um, it really perks up the contract. So now we're going to take these uh, data, we're going to uh, in invert them, and now the same thing we do before, 1D inversion, stitch them together, and we get these regions sort of high conductivity and regions of low conductivity. And then to interpret that, they end up with realizing that, okay, the salts are flowing this way. These are regions of high conductivity. So salts must be inflowing into this system this way. And they're actually outflowing here. The, the blues are sort of extending outward from the river. So it gives you an idea of where the salts are coming in. And where, which portions of the river are actually being freshened. Uh, somebody was asking earlier about time lapse, I, I think. Yeah, that's you. So here is an example. This has been reflown in 2015, and that has provided an opportunity to uh, see what the difference has been. We don't actually have those results, but there are significant differences in. So that's basically it. You've got this uh, region up top that is uh, you know, losing these, these fertilizer salts and then coming down in, into the river. And uh, we kind of now understand where, where things are moving as far as uh, system gaining salts or losing salts. Oh. Uh, yeah, there's another really short uh, frequency domain case history that uh, I, don't know, I thought would be interesting. It, it's interesting from a couple of perspectives. Uh, a main one being that the kind of fundamental things that we've been doing, they're easily scalable. It's one of the great things about electromagnetics is that we can scale things uh, to look different sizes. So we were in Tokyo. Uh, a few months ago, and I was talking to a good friend of mine, uh, Yuji Bitsuhada. He's actually the director for AIST, 
which is the Japanese uh, industrial kind of research uh, group that's connected with problems. And I, I said, what, you, what kinds of things are you doing? And he, he takes out his uh, brochure, and on the front cover of the brochure is this picture. And I thought, well, how appropriate is that, right? Because we look at this, and you know, what do we see? Well, we've got uh, you know, oil and natural gas uh, production offshore. We've got a C4EM experiment. Maybe it's connected with uh, methane hydrates. Uh, there's groundwater, seawater interfaces <coughs> being looked at. Uh, there's uh, CO2 uh, storage uh, subsurface, or maybe aquifer storage. Radioactive waste disposal, We've got hot springs, maybe a geothermal reservoir coming up here. There's mining, so acid mine drainage, mineral deposits, uh, big heat source. So, all kinds of things that they're currently working on, but these are actually all parts of things that are connected with the disk. Well, that's a perfect image. Anyway, so what were they doing? Uh, there was an earthquake in Japan, and uh, that <coughs> promoted a landslide, which subsequently covered up a couple of cars and uh, buried people. And what they realized, they didn't have an effective response to something happened to you to quickly go out and, and survey the region. So they decided to put together something uh, that was based on a drone and to use that to move, move that over survey area. So here's what they did. So they made a sensor, <clears throat> well, transmitter here, and receiver. So it's exactly like we were talking about, horizontal coplanar, and multi-frequencies. But the, the, the sensor actually has to be a certain distance away from the drone. That's your, uh, your transport device. Uh, and so they had to do a noise test, and they found that if that sensor was only three meters away, we had noise that was shown in black. If it was uh, four meters, then we were red. If we were five meters, it was blue. So it basically meant, like, okay, if you're going to tow this thing, it's going to be at least five meters away from towing. Okay? Uh, the second is, that we've got to get energy into the ground and get it back. And remember, there was this one over R cube, so the transmitter loses energy in one over R cube, and so does the receiver. So uh, that means you need to fly as close as possible to, to help you. So, kind of like the principles that we're talking about for larger scale airborne are still the principles that are used here. So, what they did is uh, take this aircraft, there were two cars that were buried uh, and they flew it over the over the region and then you can see that the uh, signal strength which is all in just the real part of the signal is made <coughs> part in here that was turned up to be one of the cars and so the, the lines are 100 percent straight but you're flying a drone <coughs> and uh, this is you know, this is only about 12 so it's all a very, very small scale, but all of the principles that we've talked about completely carry over. So the car that has a very small response, is that because you've flown over the side of it and not directly over it? Uh, this one's about three meters deep. This one's about one and a half meters deep. So it's the depth. Yeah, so it's the depth. Yeah. Anyway, we've got a whole host of case histories. We won't go through, go, go through them. But there is a case history for minerals. Uh, this is the one where we had a loop on the surface of the Earth and the helicopter measured the total field magnetics uh, up in the air. There is another one where both the frequency and time domain EM was doing airborne. And that introduces a, a slightly different kind of inversion algorithm to get up the information. And there it's really interesting to see what the relationship is of part of the information content from the time and the frequency. And 
another minerals deposits, and then in Australia or Austria, it was it was a landslide. So again, they used a frequency domain system. And there's a tutorial on UXO and as well as a case history. Depending on where we go, UXOs sometimes are actually really of interest. And it's like, okay, how do we how do we find these things? How do we not only find them, but you have to determine which kind of ordnance item it is and whether it's something that you can just leave in the ground, okay, or you actually need to dig it up. Because the biggest expense with uh, uh, removal of ordnance or really trying to get, find the unexploded ones that could be harmful is actually distinguishing between just stuff that's there, shrapnel, and a real live <coughs> item. So that's a challenge. And uh, there's a short Now I'm going to switch gears. I want to go to grounded sources. Uh, so what's our motivation for for this? Uh, there's actually a lot of places that we like we can't use inductive sources, especially well. If, especially if we're looking deep in, in the seafloor, uh, some things with oil and gas, uh, volcanoes, minerals. Uh, there's just a lot of situations here where we actually want to have a source that's grounded. And what this does, it, it provides an opportunity for us to do two, look at two things that we looked at this morning and put them together. The first was the DC resistivity experiment. So there we had ground electrodes, and then we had these currents that flow through. And the other was inductive sources, where we had time varying magnetic fields gave rise to currents. In this experiment, we're actually going to do the following. We're going to take, take a wire, put a generator on it, ground it, and then we're going to put in a time varying current in, in here which is going to give rise to a time-varying magnetic field. And that is going to generate vortex currents, as well as we've got these DC currents. So there's, in, in doing ground sources, now we've got the ability to kind of merge the two things that we were talking about this morning. So the first of all, I just want to establish one piece of intuition here, and that's if I have an electric dipole in a bowl space. So, What's a dipole? It's just like a little bit of wire, okay? Maybe a little generator that's that, that's attached on. And I'm going to run it to so it's in DC, and then I'm just going to eventually turn it off. At DC, the currents kind of look like this. And now I turn that off, and the question is, well, what what happens? So I turn this off at 10 to minus 4 milliseconds. There's a diffusion time. And the current system looks like this. A little bit later, like that. <coughs> later, later, later. The concept that is important here is that if I have a current filament and then I let it go, that it just sort of diffuses outwards in all directions. And loses amplitude. So the the amplitudes on here are really greatly different. So this is 10 to the minus 1, that's 10 to the minus 2, it's 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, right? So the yellows here are kind of deceiving. They're, they're really, things are really scaling down in amplitude. But the important part, and this is the thing to carry away, is if I ever have a, a current that's been in your, and I no longer have a forcing function. Just 
use that word anyway. So let's now look at frequency versus uh, time domain. You know, and we've kind of been through that. The main part with the harmonic currents is that there's uh, always, it's always partitioned into a real and uh, imaginary. So just to show you this, and this I think this really emphasizes how uh, how, how related both frequency and time domain data are. So what I'm, I'm going to show you a sequence of plots in which this is a time, so after shut off, this is a time of 10 to the minus 4 milliseconds. I take the reciprocal of that, now I get a frequency of 10 to the 4 kilohertz. And we're going to look at what the currents are in both of them. So, at this level here, the diffusion distance is 4 meters. The skin depth is 2 meters, and this is what the two currents look like. At 10 to the minus 3 milliseconds, we've got this comparison. 10 to the minus 2, we've got this. 10 to the minus 1, we've got that. And at 1 millisecond, we've got something that looks like this. So the bottom line here is that you know, if you're trying to kind of make your way between a frequency and time domain system, if you look at took your time and then took the reciprocal of that, that you'd be ending up with a, uh, a, a frequency that had the same uh, the same kind of currency. So early time high frequencies are the same. Late time low frequencies uh, are pretty much the same. Okay, so now let's start to put things to, to, together. So we're going to have a bipole, which gives us a, uh, we're just going to plunk a positive current in. And, or it could be a laid out in a horseshoe, it could be a straight line. And there's a lot of geometries that you can work with, but we're just going to use a simple example uh, of this part, just a half space. And just try to figure out, okay, what should we expect? Okay, so first of all, you think about this. Suppose I got a current just in a wire, you know, current like that, and it's kind of going that way. Right? So we've got current going this way and that way. What's gonna happen to this system when I turn it on? So we can actually think about this in, in two parts. So let's break it up. First of all, a wire. Suppose I got a wire. There's a curtain wire. Now I just turn that curtain on. It's going to happen. <clears throat> Sorry? I think the current will decay outwards and downwards. Okay, and what does the current look like when you... Turn it off. I don't know if I understand the question. The electrons start moving, stop moving, or yeah, good point. Yeah, the electrons are quit moving in the wire. Okay, and then what? What? Ha what's going to happen in the ground? Well, it'll start. I guess current field will start between. Subject to right, so in that case, you're both in the same line, but, but we need to step back. Okay, what what happens? <laughs> what does the ground look like? What what are what are the currents looking like immediately after I turn that current off in the wire? What direction? Sure. Or and what's their shape? Yeah, so you're, everybody's right on, okay, after the fuse is down. I, I want to get back to what happens, what do the currents look like immediately after I turn things off? Or what currents are there? Uh, I mean, immediately, you think it would cease in the wire itself, but in the ground, it would basically be as it is forward. 
Right. Perfect. So I'm not sure that everybody got that. <coughs> the moment that I turn that current off in the wire, there's a time-bearing magnetic field on the Earth, mm -hmm. right? So that, the Earth is going to respond in such a way as to keep that magnetic <coughs> flux constant, which means that there is a current that is then going to be put, it's like an image current, right underneath the wire. So the moment that I turn that current off, there's now, the current kind of gets transferred to the ground. And there's now an image, there's a current that is in the ground in the same direction as the initial current. And then once I've got that, then I come back to the statement, so like, okay, now it just disappears. But I first got to make that leap of the moment I turn it off, now I've transferred what used to be a current in the wire, it is now in the ground. So that's the important part here. So wire, wires are really, really important in electromagnetics because that is providing you know, a source of magnetic flux. And the moment I turn this guy off, there's going to be current in the ground, and then that is going to go up. OK? What about these other currents? I turned the generator off. Now what happens to them? So those were the steady state. These were the currents in the DC resistivity problem. Anybody? <coughs> so I used to have currents that were flowing this way. Now I turn my generator off. What happens to those currents? Yeah, they just going to flow away. So anytime you have an unforced current, it's just going to disappear. So they're going to go like that. So now I can put all those two things together, and I've really got two sets of currents here. One is, you know, the kind of the current or currents that come from the wire, and the other was just this diffusion. So we can actually see that. So here's here, here's a case. So it's uh, from, from one of the apps. It's provided. So this is a cross section. So here's the A electrode. Here's the B. So you know, it's kind of currents are going in the earth like that. Immediately after turnoff, or a short time after, you can see all the currents are really confined to the surface region. So that later they're like that, later like that, like that. Okay. So that's that's what's happening. Good. So now let's do let's do one more thing because this we work our way through this, then we've got a pretty good understanding about what's going on. That is that now what I want to do is I want a target. I want to put a target, I'm going to put a target right underneath the wire. And the question is, can I see this and how? And ultimately, we're going to come back and try to parse out which fields we want to, to measure. So here's the situation. We've got current going like this. It's going through here. So that's the DC resistivity part. So we've got good, good coupling here for DC resistivity, right? All these charges that are built up, no problem. We also have good coupling from an induced point of view, right? So we've got magnetic fields that are coming in here. So time-varying magnetic fields, that's going to generate currents that are in here, so circular currents. And they're going to give rise to magnetic fields. So that this thing just looks like it's uh, it, it, it's got good coupling. And yeah, so what we want to do is to see what the results are for doing this this experiment. So here's what we have. So initially in steady state, we've got well, can we tell from here? Do we have a conductor or a resistor? It's a conductor, yeah. So you can see how things are kind of being sucked in here, right? So there's a conductor in here. Immediately after I I turn this system off for a while, not immediately, but after a little while, look what happens. I get current lines that are going like this. So these are circular currents, these are vortex currents that are going through here. 
the main, you know, the highest intensity is up at the surface, but these current lines are all going around like this, which means those are induced currents. Those are vortex currents. A little bit later, these currents are diffusing in, right? So now we're we're seeing more yellow down the bottom. A little bit later, they, they look like this. So the currents are kind of going around. And then interestingly enough, at even later time, things that happen, they're no longer the main currents are no longer circular, but they're actually going through this way. So these are kind of like galvanic currents, whereas these guys here are like vortex currents. So it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on here, right? So there's We've got this block, and there's this response. So we've got currents that are circular going around in there, and then a little bit later, those guys die out, and the main currents are just stuff that's going across. <coughs> yeah, and that's the latest time. So that's sort of the summary. If we have a conductor that at uh, sort of mid mid times. That the main contribution are these, uh, you know, currents are kind of circular in here, and then at later times they're uh, they're kind of down that. So that's a conductor. One last question: What's going to happen if we have a resistor? Anybody game enough? Are we going to see the same? Are we going to see different? Will you see some sort of circulating current on the outside of that conductor? On the outside of the resistor? I thought maybe you want to see the current in there. You don't get currents through the, the little cube. You'll induce another current inside it. I think you were right, except for maybe but you, you'll only measure maybe the induced current from that when you're comparing it and you'll. Okay, you, you, you might have it right or almost. Anybody else? Okay, so think, think about the basics here with respect to how EM induction works with respect to conductors and resistors. Right, so there's, in a resistor, there's still an electric field, but there's no currents. So what that means is that, oh, uh, shoot, I forgot to ask. Uh, mm, rats. Uh, I have to hold that just for a second because I forgot to ask you about this. Sorry about that. So here was our state. This is where I wanted to go. So here was our state with the conductor, if we can rewrap your mind about 90 seconds ago. So at the initial states, we've got currents that are going like this, and late states, they're, they're going like this. So now my question is, OK, which fields do we want to measure? Okay, I mean, so we're talking about electromagnetic fields, so we can measure E, we can measure H, but I mean, electric or magnetic fields. Suppose that I've got a, uh, at, let's suppose I say that's the X direction. Okay, so that's X, that's, that's Y. So let me make it, you see, suppose you want to make an electric, you're going to measure an electric field. Which direction? For which component of the electric field would you want to measure? Anybody? X. X. Yes. So if we measure, and there's two reasons that we want to do that. One is that 
you know, so here's positive and negative charges. So there's the clear electric field along this direction in the x direction. So that's the DC resistivity. We measure in the inline electric field, just the same as you'd want to do for the marine CSEM. The other thing is that you notice these vortex currents that are going like this, right? So they have an electric field that's also in that x direction. So both for, for both of these guys, we'd want to measure an electric field in the x direction. And look what we get. So this is the half space. And then here's the conductor. Okay. So at this early time, we get a significantly different signal. The little one millisecond, it's huge. These are very, very different signatures. So you're seeing that block really, really shine up. And at 10 milliseconds, it's still. So there is a, that is a field that you really want to measure, and that's a field that's very diagnostic. OK, how about B? So let's measure a magnetic field. Which component of B would you want? <clears throat> Yeah, so there's two components of B. One is that, so we're sitting over here, the currents, the currents are going this way, so the magnetic field is perpendicular to that, so we're going to have a magnetic field if the BY is going to be a really good one. Uh, if we go offline, then perhaps BZ is also. Okay. So here's what happens with the BY field. Here's the half space. And here's what the conductor is. Look at one millisecond. It's huge. So it's very diagnostic. That's similar to 10 milliseconds. So EX, BY, and if we went to BZ, it would also be a good thing. So magnetic fields are kind of going up one side, down the other. And you can see how that is manifesting itself. So if you have a situation like that, you're measuring the EX, BY, BZ, those are probably really good fields to measure. So that's always important. If you're going out, you're going to do a survey or something, and you kind of know the geometry, then you know, just knowing which field components are the most sensitive is hugely important. OK. So now, <laughs> so here's the we rewind. Now we can go back to the question that I was asking. So now suppose we have a resistance. Let's go back one slide for a second, please. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around the scales. Yep. Uh, so this is 10 to the minus 10. As a function of time, everything is going to decrease. So these okay. time to make curves, yeah. like there's often five or six orders of magnitude. So this is 10 to the minus 10, 11, 13. So there's three orders of magnitude difference. There. These scales are the same. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we put a resistor in. <coughs> so we can tell it's a resistor because we're kind of pushing pushing stuff outward. And then the question is what what happens? That, at this sort of earlier time, the, the currents are like this. Okay? So they're, they're just going across. Later, they go across. Later, they go across. So there's no vortex currents, right? So there's an electric field that's going like that, but there's no currents because there's no competition. So the result of a resistor is that basically the currents are all just going this way. So it's just like galvanic currents, just like DC. DC. So there's no induced currents. Okay, so the ramifications there on which fields you want to measure for the electric field, what do we want? Yeah, we still want EX. That's perfect. Here's the half space. Here's the. And anything else? No. 
for the conductor, we chose BY. For this resistor, nah, not very much there. A little bit. Okay. And BZ, kind of the same. So, we put all that together, and we're starting to, we're now really starting to kind of pick up on like, what's going on, right? So here's our half space, EX, BY, PZ. If we have a conductor, EX, BY, BZ, those are all hugely different from this side. If we have a resistor, EX is good, but BY, BZ, you know, there's, there's not very much there. So this plot kind of tells you why in the marine EM experiment, when people were looking for hydrocarbons at depth, what's your first order experiment? Well, some kind of electric dipole inject currents through there. And to first order, the best field that I can measure is an inline electric field. So what's the optimum experiment? Let's put a current dipole in. Let's just tow a whole line of, of receivers. Again. Just by understanding some first principles gives you some really major kind of advantages in understanding, okay, what experiment should I even consider as a first Well, I mean, from there we can go on. We can build complexities. I mean, you know, if you have thin plates in there, you're going to get different couplings, both from the uh, DC resistivity as well as EM, change that, things you're going to happen. But, you can tell, even from what we've just done with just a simple case, that things get complicated, right? Because we've got vortex currents, and later we've got the organic currents, and yeah. At, at some point, you just can't do it anymore. You just appeal to numerical simulations and go So what I'd like to do now is to do a, a case history. Actually, I can do two. Uh, one that has to do with the Deccan traps. How many people have heard of the Deccan traps? And ah, good. What's in what regard? Plasma of the salts. Pardon me. Plasma of the salts. And okay. And uh, any ramifications of them, or you know? ramifications for uh, environmental considerations. But from a geophysical point of view, <clears throat> huge expanses of parallel uh, lava flows that have uh, pretty well uniform properties. Not very interesting. But very thick. Very <laughs> thick, yes. Anybody else have anything to offer about Deccan traps? <clears throat> I'm guessing it's very difficult to image below the size. Yep. Anything else? Well, there is something. Uh, these are huge flood basalts that happened in India occurring about 65 million years ago, plus minus, at about the same time that the uh, dinosaurs became extinct. And there was, for many years, uh, a hypothesis that it was all of the outgassing that came from these flood basalts uh, that just marginalized the environment and led to the potential extinction of dinosaurs. Uh, that may have impacted now, it's all believed that uh, it was a meteorite impact in uh, Chexaloop in the Yucatan that uh, did that. But uh, those are kind of the reasons that, but the, for, I mean, just millions of cubic kilometers of blood basalts were in, uh, were generated. So why, what this is of interest, uh, it, this was actually a hydrocarbon are promoted by the hydrocarbon industry uh, because there are large uh, thicknesses of the salt. It was very, it's virtually impossible, at least the technology that they had, to image below there. There was every reason to believe there was a lot of sediments underneath, and maybe those sediments contain hydrocarbons. The 
geologic understanding or the best guesses was that the sedimentary thickness increased as you went from the north uh, to, to the south. And one of the big questions is, can we, can we somehow determine if there's uh, a thickness of, you know, what's the thickness of salt and what's the thickness of the sediments under? So that was really the question. They did a DC resistivity survey. Uh, this was across this section here. And what they ended up with is this region in here. So the basalts are resistive. So they're maybe 150 to 600 ohm meters. The sediments are low resistivity, maybe 30 ohm meters. And underneath the basement might be really quite resistive. In this particular section, what they found was that you know, the salts are maybe a kilometer or more, a couple of kilometers of, of, of sediments across here. But that was sort of early stage results, and it wasn't quite clear just how good those were. And also, what they were much more interested in is what happens as you go north to south. So here's what the survey was, and they used something called MOTEM, which stands for Long Offset Time Domain EM Data. And basically, it's the following. We put a grounded source in here that's one to two kilometers long, and then you measure, anywhere from two to 50 kilometers, uh, magnetic fields, either the E's or the H's or some combination of, of them. So that's the experiment, and they did about 10 lines of, of data. So here's one, two, so all these yellow places indicate lines. If you're going to do a survey, then you want to, first of all, do a little bit of survey design and testing to see if you can answer the question that you're interested in. In other words, kind of like a sensitivity analysis. So here's the, here was the first uh, question. Is that had to do with the thickness of the basalt. If you took this time domain survey and you did computed the forward responses from a basalt that was either one and a half, two, or three kilometers thick, would you notice any difference? Uh, the answer to that is yes, you do. So these are the results. So that seemed to indicate that you might be sensitive to that thickness. Uh, the other had to do with just this, uh, the resistivity of the sediments themselves, if it was 20, 50, or 100, would you be able to see it? And again, the answer was, yeah, you can't. So that meant, OK, surveys might be good to go. Let's give it a shot. So they did that through all these sections. And what we're seeing here, so, so now in each of these lines, so they've got a transmitter. And then they measure along these lines. And then each of them, you, you could just invert in a 1D sounding kind of mode. And then you get, in this case, like a three-layer model. Uh, the top region here being uh, the basalts. That's resistant. And then there's a conductive sediment in here, and then a resistant basement. And on line L here, on this end, you see, this is about a kilometer thick sediment, uh, buried about a kilometer or more beneath the surface. So that's what happens along this line. If you go down to line uh, G down here, you find that the thickness of the, of the sediments seems to be decreasing. This is like barely a half a kilometer. And if you go down to line K, there's no sediments at all. <clears throat> this is extremely interesting because it kind of went opposite to what the initial geology uh, had, had thought. And uh, yeah, goes uh, sedimentary thickness was was decreasing. In electromagnetic induction. It's not necessarily just the electrical conductivity of, uh, of the layer that's important. It's really the conductivity thickness product, something called the conductance. And in those previous plots, we plotted off the conductance 
at each place and image that. And it turned out that this is the region up here that has got the greatest conductance for the, for, for the sediment. So they thought, okay, well, let's drill it. So they drilled that. Prior to drilling, this is essentially what they had interpreted. I mean, it's a simple interpretation, but it was basically what was done. Uh, there is a basalt up top down to a depth of about 1,400 meters. And then uh, sediments for another 1,500 meters, and then basalt underneath. So that's, that's what they had obtained prior to, well, after the inversion of the EM data. When they drilled the well, it actually came up uh, pretty close to that. So this upper region in here is all top 1,400 is, is deck and trap. And then there's this region in here is all uh, sedimentary uh, stuff. And then underneath here, you've got the salt basin. So it actually worked out uh, you know, pretty well as far as uh, kind of gross matching of what the uh, geological often was. So anyway, that's a, it's kind of an interesting case history. Again, it's kind of the salt hydrocarbon motivated, but it shows that by taking uh, you know, electromagnetic data in the time domain and inverting it, you can get out something that's, uh, that's So I've got one more case history for uh, hydrocarbons, and it's from the Barrett Sea. It's from uh, rock solid images. Uh, does the following. So we're up here in uh, Norway. It's uh, Barrett Sea. Uh, it's a hoop fault uh, complex. And it's an area with uh, no hydrocarbon reserves. And the seismic is, is pretty good for getting all of the, the structural in information. But it actually is not very good from the point of view of uh, determining the set hydrocarbon saturation. And uh, what you really want to do is to and not only find the reservoirs, but make sure that you, you think it's uh, high quality hydrocarbon as opposed to fizz gas or water or something like that. So the question here was, okay, can we use you know, both the seismic and whatever borehole data that, that they have and the CSEM to really help kind of characterize the, the reservoir. So this is what the marine uh, EM experiment is. And you know, here's, here's the reservoirs down here. And the question is, OK, are these guys good quality hydrocarbons or not? So why does uh, marine EM offer some promise in here? Uh, this diagram really uh, kind of summarize things. So up on this axis, here we've got the acoustic impedance. And this axis, we've got the uh, resistivity. What we're looking at here are different colors. So the blue is wet. Uh, the yellow is 20% uh, gas or just fizz. The green is 80% oil. And the red is 80% gas. If you look at acoustic impedance, so if you pick a particular acoustic impedance, let's say this number here, and you go all the way across, you get blue, yellow, red, green. So there's acoustic impedance simply doesn't distinguish those. Uh, whereas if you look at the resistivity, you see that in the low resistivity regions in here between 1 and 10 ohm meters, we got blue and yellow, which are wet and busy. If you look in here at you know 50 ohm meters or more, you got green and red, which is 80% gas or 80% oil. So that particular diagram is that's the reason that you might think about using electromagnetics to help help you out. And if you look at the resistivity as a function of hydrocarbon saturation, you see that below saturations of about 80.7, uh, the resistivity is 20 ohm meters or less. 
But beyond that, it rises really quite steeply. So that the resistivity for 70 or 80 percent uh, is actually really quite high. So now we're going to do a survey. Uh, we're going to collect, or they collected, uh, CSEM data coincident with the seismic data uh, with simultaneous uh, cables. So the system is, is like this. There's a, a transmitter, a CSEM transmitter, and then it's towing a whole bunch of uh, electrical re receivers, so it's just a whole bunch of voltage uh, measurements that are going to be generated across it. So that's, that's the cable. Uh, this distance here from the seafloor to the hydrocarbon layers is actually a couple of kilometers or more. Remember I talked to you about a factor of three. Uh, so if this is two kilometers deep, then you actually need to have a cable that's at least you know, six kilometers long. And this, uh, so they end up using a cable that was uh, just about eight kilometers long. That's a big experiment, so it's a, it's a lot of cable. And uh, then they're going to use frequencies from 0.2 to 3 hertz. Okay, so that's that's their survey. Sorry, Doug, yeah. you said beneath the sea floor, but Sorry. isn't it from the cable? <coughs> right, so they're, they're dragging the cable, they're, they're trying to drag the cable fairly fa fairly close to the, to the sea floor. So what type of water depth can they do that in? A lot of the work I've seen with CSEM has been in like two kilometers in water depth. Yeah. Uh, so they drag it down <clears throat> hundreds of meters off the seafloor? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. so. Yeah. Try to get as close as you can. They also deploy receivers that sit right on the seafloor. That's right, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, sometimes they'll have three components. I can talk a bit more about that, but they can have three component receivers measuring magnetic fields and all electric fields sitting right on the seafloor as they're pulling some transmitter. Uh, yeah, so here's their CSEM survey, like this, and then they did one line across here. That's the line we're actually going to concentrate on. And there's four wells that really are of interest. So there's alternative, uh, that was drilled and was dry. And then there is uh, Centra, which is here, which is was drilled and is productive. So those are kind of like the control wells. So those are those were assumed to be known. And then Hansen was here and Bala over here. Uh, those are going to be validation wells. So the idea is to try to see. Okay, which of these guys might be uh, high quality hydrocarbon or both or, or not? Okay. So, we're going to look at uh, data that are along that line. So, first of all, what do the data look like? This is the amplitude. Remember, so remember on that secondary field, we had something that had an amplitude and it had a phase, right? We cast that into real imaginary parts. But we could have just kept it as amplitude and phase. So we're going to look, so imagine now a streamer cable. We've got a transmitter here, and then we've got all these electric field sensors going out like this, right? So there's the nearest one that's like 31 meters away, and we can imagine pulling that guy. So as we do that, the amplitude for that is this red line going on. Then there's you know, another receiver that's farther away, and as we do that, this is what seems measured, and then the one that's really seven and a half kilometers away, uh, this is the response that we get. So that's how we understand this diagram. And if you look at the amplitude, there's not, you know, at least at this scale, there's not really very much that's apparent by, by the eye. However, if we look at the phase, there's just a lot happening here, right? So we're moving along, and there's a real large change in that value between over here and over here. So there's, there's signal there. You can, you can tell there's something happening. So there's significant response. 
So here's the seismic data. It's been uh, color coded by amplitude. So here's their structural horizons that, that, that are picked. And now what we want to do is to uh, you know, look at this and see where the potential wells are and how we might do this. So from their seismic analysis, for which I really don't know very much at all about how this is transferred, the, the this first plot that we have here are lithofluid bases. And uh, the what we have in, in here, okay, the green, are basically places that they've got uh, you know, clean oil or fizz gas. Uh, and here we have clay content that's postulated, and here we have total cross. So this is this is information that they had inferred with just the seismic and well log data of, of the law. And importantly, two things here: the, con the two control wells. So there was central, which is here. So this was a very good producer, right? And then there was alternative here, which is the other control well and it is it basically dry. Okay, so that's that's okay. Of interest here are these two others. There's Hansen over here and there's Balland. So now the question is okay for these two which uh, you know which do we think is going to be the better potential for actually being high quality hydrocarbon? Because the ingredients here could be they could be clean oil or they could be fizz gas. So we don't we don't really know. Looks like there's more of them over here than here. Than so here. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's a better play. So we're, again we come back to this basic diagram here where we look at hydrocarbon saturation. Uh, so for the resistivity, it looks like this. So remember, by the time you get 0.6 or 0.7, the resistivity uh, increases dramatically. If we look at the seismic velocity, P wave velocity, you said, by the time you get to point two saturation of hydrocarbons, add that in, it just doesn't make any difference. It just it stays flat. So that's why the P wave velocity is just doesn't help you with respect to determining what the quality is. But you can see that the combination of uh, the resistivity added onto that could make a big difference. So the CSEM is then uh, processed, so it's, it's, it's inverted. And clearly the guy who really stands out is, is central here, but that's already known, that was controlled, that, that's productive. Of the two validation wells, Balland and Hansen, uh, Hansen is definitely more resistant. It doesn't come up quite as nicely on this diagram as what it might, but you can, I think even you can see that this is more resistant than, than that. And now if we put all of that t together along with the, the previous data, they, they combine that into hydrocarbon saturation. And what they predict is that you know, this, well here is much lower hydrocarbon saturation than this, and those two wells were then drilled. This was found to be productive, and this was not. So based on you know, this, Upper plot here, where you might have gone ahead and chose Balland over that, uh, the uh, incorporation of the uh, CSEM has you know, de risked things and suggested to do something. But I think it's kind of a nice example, and certainly one of the nicer mm -hmm. examples that, uh, that I've seen, even though this is now a couple of years old. Um, Let's see. There's a lot of things I could talk about with respect to controlled source EM. I don't think we want to go into all of that. But there is one thing that I would like to show you. Uh, uh, we talked about it earlier. It has to do with the general experiment and with uh, something called the airway. Let me just kind of flip through this. I think you're, you're going to see a lot of CSEM work done in the next decade. 
Summary massive sulfides. Uh, this is so you get these big smokers, um, you know, mid ocean ridges, they get all, all of these minerals. And so you got a high mineral concentration right on the ocean floor. So the Japanese are actually going to be uh, mining these, I think, probably this year. So what it means is uh, that these regions of mineral content, they're sitting right on the ocean floor, and you just put machines down, they just grind stuff up, pump it back up to a ship, haul it to shore, and finish the processing. So it's, at some level it's actually e you know, ecologically perhaps less invasive than doing some of the surface mining on land. Um, Although I've heard the sediment potentially that's stirred up. Pardon me? The sediment that's stirred up potentially will take years to settle back. Yeah, good. Uh, there's no free lunch, <laughs> undoubtedly. Yeah, but I, I think that kind of depends upon the footprint that you're you're, you're dealing with. And so, yeah, there's nothing that we can do that doesn't come without a cost. Uh, I think you're going to see the Japanese. Uh, anyway, there's you know, methane hydrates, tectonic studies, offshore UXO, uh, and groundwater. So there's a lot of uh, I'm going to steal that from Nexon. Don't do Oh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's pretty weak, too. Uh, so the reason that C4EM kind of works is, you know, depending on whether the you know, seawater is really conductive, freshwater is really resistive, there's sediments, hydrocarbons sort of have that 100 old meter uh, range. Uh, hydrates, gas hydrates are really resistive. They could be a couple thousand ohm meters. And massive sulfides are really quite conductive. So there's this, like, just a, a lot of different things out there that um, have very distinct resistivity contrasts, which means that they might be really uh, useful to mine. Here's a kind of a canonical uh, example that we want to, to, to talk about. Oh, that's better. Thank you, Max. Uh, so we've got an ocean, we've got a sediment, and then maybe we've got a hydrocarbon reservoir. Okay, so we're going to try to find this guy. So we've got a transmitter here, we've got receivers, and as you know, we could have receivers just on, on the ocean floor. And you're going to pull this guy around. And then the ticket was that you need to have, if this reservoir is D, then this distance here between transmitter and receiver should be at least three times that. So. Uh, yeah, so here's, here's a plot I, I just wanted to, to, to mention. So suppose that we're, we're towing this, this system and we, we're plotting. So this line here is offset, and this is electric field. And we're measuring what that signal is uh, with, with, with offset. And here's the interesting thing. So the electric field strength kind of goes down like this. So it's decaying very exponentially. And then it kinks. There's something that happens here. And instead of kind of continuing down, it goes flat. And the question is, what is that guy? What's happening? And uh, what's its effect? Now, if we put in a hydrocarbon layer in, in, in here, if that hydrocarbon layer is you know, sufficiently close to the uh, sediment interface, it might actually be that there's a signal from the hydrocarbon layer that you know, sort of exceeds this and this thing is not a problem. But if the hydrocarbon layer is deep, then it could be that the hydrocarbon layer kind of comes in like this, and it's, it's sort of some signal in here that you're really interested in, but that whatever's happening here is overtaking it. 
in our case here, what I'm going to show you, that is the cake. So here is, here's what happens if I put in the reservoir in here, then the signal looks like this. So this is hugely different, like with the reservoir or without. That's big signal. You know, we could capture that and determine that there's a hydrocarbon reservoir there. So this would be, this would be like the ideal case. Notwithstanding, there is a question about what is happening here. And what I want to do is just show you a movie that explains what everything is. It also serves as an opportunity to kind of revisit some of the fundamentals that we've done before. Yeah, actually, I'll show you this. So, so for thinking about energy traveling from a transmitter to receiver, so here we've got transmitter, here we've got a receiver. So how can the energy travel? Well, it can travel through the ocean. Right? Uh, it could travel through the sediments. It could travel in a hydrocarbon layer. And it possibly could go up and travel in the air and come down. So those are four possible rigs. So for seismologists, uh, those are the kinds of things that would be your sort of bread and butter cut, great paths. <clears throat> what I'm not going to show you is a movie that Soggy has uh, put together with some uh, software that uh, provided by uh, Dieter Weitmuller. Uh, it's going to be a movie of the electric field as a function of time. So, you so this is now a time domain experiment. So I've got, imagine I've got a ground electric dipole, and I've got to turn that current off. Then what happens to the, what happens to the fields? How do they propagate up? The thing about the time domain is that you really understand, you can really see the physics. And what you're going to see is the following. So first of all, this is ocean. This is sediments. So remember the diffusion distance depends on the resistivity. So the higher the resistivity, the longer the diffusion distance is. So at a particular time, the waves should travel further in resistive medium than they do in conductive. Okay, so this is more resist, or this is more resistive than, than that. Okay, so we might expect this to go out faster than that. So you can look for that. The other thing is that this hydrocarbon layer is very resistant. So any energy that fit, gets into here might just diffuse along zippity doo, right, really quickly uh, because it's quite resistant. And then similarly, the air is also very resistant. So it might also come along here. So those are the things to kind of prompt you. Now we'll see what happens. Okay, so right there, do you notice how far down this has come compared to that, right? So the diffusion this is more resistant, so it goes farther in, in a specific amount of time. And now what we're going to see is this energy hitting this boundary. Okay, so now the energy is just about to hit. Watch. Okay, see? So that energy has hit this layer, and now it can diffuse quickly through here. So it's it's coming along here. And as it comes along, okay, then it radiates energy, just like a, uh, it's like, kind of like a head wave, right? Uh, and it radiates wave energy up. And your receiver is sitting up here. So that can, uh, yeah, it can be like a first arrival, if you like. Okay, yeah, so the next thing, is the energy that went up here, and you can see that it just flashes through. I missed it. So you can see that 
how it flashes through. I'll, I'll do that again. I'll try to catch it just at the time that's critical. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, so there it's just about it. Watch the surface. There. See how it just flashes through? So that movie in 20 seconds becomes, the whole thing becomes completely understandable. It's like, okay, of course, that's what happens. If you actually look, try to make a movie in the frequency domain, because the primary field is always in, it's actually pretty difficult to figure out what's going on. But if you look at it in the time domain, the time step, then you see the physics. And then once you understand the physics, then you can go back to the frequency domain and now everything kind of makes a whole bunch more sense. Anyway, I thought you might be interested in that, especially for anybody who's been a little bit mystified about all these people talking about airwaves and what's going on. Uh, there's nothing mysterious. It's it, The foundation for this is in a wonderful paper by a guy named Peter Leidelt. He's a German, well, he unfortunately died a couple years ago, but uh, a German electromagnetic kind of geophysicist who just did some really fine stuff. Can we see the movie one more time? Absolutely. Actually, I'll show you another movie. Uh, it's the, um, it, we can plot the pointing vector. So that's the the energy bounce rate. Did I just do that one? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so there is something on methane hydrates here. So the flattening of the curve in the background field up there. Yeah. Is that, is that basically that airwave then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the airwave comes in and then it propagates down, and that's now it's like a first arrival coming in. Exactly. Yeah. So since presumably you know the, uh, the bit tree, you can, you can model that airwave and remove it from the results? I think that's probably what people have been trying to, to do. Uh, there, there's certainly a lot of work done on trying to remove it. I'm not sure where the state of the art or practice is with respect to it. For those people who are, have done DC resistivity, uh, oh. There is a section in here. I'll just put up. I'm just going to put up this one slide. It's, it's a little bit of a teaser. If people want to talk about it tomorrow, we can. But yeah, we, we talk about DC resistivity is going on, and then you turn it off, and then you. Uh, you kind of look and see what, what happens here. But if you actually think about what's going on, uh, you could think about this as also being a time domain experiment where you've got a DC, you know, DC current, and then you turn it off quickly, and then you measure fields right at early times, and those are like a time domain you know, induction survey, and you could actually use those to recover the electrical content. So it's, it's data that people often tend to throw away, but uh, it's actually uh, useful. I think, uh, yeah, we have a change of pace. So where have we been? We've been to DC resistivity, with fundamentals of EM, 
We've done inductive sources. We've done grounded sources, right? And now I want to do something that's a little bit different, which is using natural sources. Pardon me? Oh. Uh, there's a couple components here. We'll, we'll just kind of work with the magnetic to uh, first. Uh, Later on, we could work with another component of this, but I, I think before we have a coffee, we could do at least the uh, magnetic tours. So what's the motivation here? The motivation is that we sometimes have big areas or big volumes that we want to control. Uh, there's volcanoes, volcanic structure. Maybe there's uh, base of the salts, obviously structure. Uh, maybe geothermal energy large-scale groundwater, mineral targets, sometimes you get these big porphyry systems that are you know, five kilometers long. And then there's uh, tectonic settings, uh, large-scale structure causing earthquakes, whatever. So what's required to see deeper? In fact, this has a lot of relevance with respect to the hydrocarbon industry, which has got uh, reservoirs that are four or five kilometers at depth. We need to get energy down. Now, if we have a, uh, a, a transmitter, it's got a particular area. Remember, it's the moment that was the key. So that's the current times the area. And really, if you have a, a control source here, then it's falling off as, energy is falling off as one of our Q. And then we get currents in here. They fall off as one over Q. And so it's one over R to the sixth. So R to 6 is a really big number, right? 2 to 6, so just increasing by factor 2, that's, that's a, a lot of uh, reduction. So you can't do anything about the attenuation, geometric attenuation of fields from the target to the receiver. But maybe if we could make a transmitter that was large enough, like a big transmitter, uh, we could kind of get rid of this geometry. So now imagine we could take a loop. Let's suppose we could make a loop, let's say 100 kilometers on the side, put it up in the air, and then have a, a plane wave, have an electromagnetic plane wave, and that has no geometric decay. So that would be, that would be the ideal situation, but it's kind of hard to make a, a loop that size. But. Fortunately, nature provides uh, a solution to that problem. So here's a, here's a cartoon. It's, it's not scale, of course. Here's the sun. And it's continually spewing out uh, solar particles so that uh, these particles come in. And they interact with the Earth's magnetosphere. So what we're seeing here is the Earth's magnetic field. And it's kind of blown back by those, those particles. And it ends up kind of being tear-shaped. There's solar storms that uh, that happen on, on the sun, and those particles can, can come in. And they, there's actually an interesting process. It's called field line reconnection, where particles coming out here get trapped, and then they get pulled back into, in, into the Earth. They spiral down the magnetic field lines and uh, funnel into the auroral zones. So I'm not sure how many people have seen Aurora here. Oh, most everybody. Good. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's wonderful, right? You get these sheets of shimmering light that, that, that come in. So here's our, um, yeah, these are sort of our equatorial uh, electrogenic currents. So the other source is, is lightning, because you now have uh, clouds and sh sheets of current that go from to the surface. So here's a movie. What you're going to see in this movie is a, an eruption on the sun. It's a solar storm. And that's going to put out a whole bunch of particles. They're going to come in, they're going to interact with the Earth's magnetic field, and they're going to come with field line reconnection, get uh, pulled back into the Earth.
So there's the solar disturbance. I've got particles that come out. And now they're going to be blown around the Earth's magnetic field. And then there's this amazing thing that comes along with the field line reconnection. It goes snap. Particles get blown in. And then funnel down into the aurora. So that's our. Uh, not sure. Yeah, that. Good, yeah. Is this one be available somewhere? This is, yeah, it's on the, it's on the web. Okay. Uh, should we have the link for it? I'll find it. Yeah. So that's on the, that's on the time scale of hours, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it'll take a few <coughs> hours yeah. for that solar storm. To, yeah. That's why they have these geomagnetic. Uh, storm in the indices and so they monitor the activity that's happening on the sun and then they can predict when the solar storms are going to hit because they these things cause huge damage or have the potential right because now you've got big currents time varying magnetic fields one of the biggest things is that uh, you know our power grid systems right so a power grid system is just a big you know bunch of connected wires right so like a big loop now you've got these currents that are there. Time bearing magnetic fields comes in that induces an EMF in that circuit loop. And if you can't uh, monitor that and uh, sort of control it, you can get a voltage surge that goes. And that happened in the late 1990s all through the eastern seaboard of the United States and in Canada. Uh, with this great big blackout that comes about because these extra voltages that, that go in just cause the transformer to burst. And then, you know, this one bursts, and now it's like a series of firecrackers going up. And if you can't shut things down quickly enough, you can cause havoc to your whole system. So that's, there's actually now a lot of effort put into you know, working with these geomagnetic storms. And one of the reasons for doing this magnetic telluric survey, and I showed you that one, uh, MT in Australia, there's another one for MT in North America. Uh, it's to use magnetic telurics to get the electrical structure of the continent because when you have a big storm that comes in, it induces telluric currents into the crust and those can funnel up into your grid system. So you have to know what's going on. So how does all this, uh, how all this work? Let's suppose you have a lightning strike. So we've got this current, and now we've got an EM field that kind of propagates. But there's a region uh, of about 100 kilometers to 500 kilometers, called the ionosphere, that is very conducting. So we get an electromagnetic wave that goes up and hits that ionosphere, reflects, goes back down. Earth is conducting, so reflects down. So the Earth We've got a kind of a cavity here. It's kind of like a waveguide in which the energy sort of bounces around, which is why a lot of the uh, information that we have uh, depends upon you know, what's happening in the tropical regions of the Earth because things can travel a long way. Yeah, so the energy is basically traveling its plane waves. If we look at the power spectrum of the magnetic field versus time, this is, these are periods, so this is 10 to the minus 3, that's 10 to the minus, or 10 to the 5, so there's 8 orders of magnitude here, and
and the longer the period, the more energy that exists. So what is uh, what does a plane wave, an electromagnetic plane wave, do when it hits the surface of the Earth? Well, it's a wave. So seismic people you know about Snell's law. Anybody does optics knows about Snell's law, and Snell's law also holds for EM waves. The wave number is is complex, but in our quasi-static solution, there's a relationship between the angle for the transmitted wave and the angle of incidence that looks like this. And the bottom line is that for the parameters of the Earth, given how conductive it is, it doesn't matter. It, even if a plane wave is coming in almost horizontally, hits the Earth and go, just refracts straight down. So very often when you talk to people in magnetic telurics, they say, oh yes, you can time think of a vertically propagating And we have crucial things that we had this morning. We had skin depth, given by this formula. And you know, the basic idea is that low frequencies travel deeper, high frequencies see shallow. So what's the difference between natural sources and control sources? Well, for the control source, we kind of know everything. We've got the transmitter location, we know the details of the waveform, geometry, we know everything. So that means we can actually model this exactly. The natural sources, that's a different kettle of fish. Because we've got a lightning strike going off over here at this time, another one over here, dot, 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 dot. And you know, we're just sitting here receiving information from all of those sources at the time. So it's the fact that things are random in space and random in time that Adds a complexity. So, what is an empty station? Well, and, and how does all of this work? So, first of all, an empty station is one in which we measure the electric fields, so it's EX and EY, as well as the magnetic fields, BX, BY. Now, this randomness is a problem, right? Because we don't know where the sources are or, or what time. That's the bad news. The good news is that if we look at Maxwell's equations, we see that E and H behave in the same way for a particular transmitter. So that means that if we somehow took effectively a ratio of E and H, then that kind of gets rid of the effects of the source. Sometimes that happens actually in a lot of different so you, you don't know something about, about a source field, okay? but if you take a ratio of fields, then you can get rid of some of the effects of the sources. So that's kind of what's done here. At each location, we could we make a, let's call it a transfer function, which is really a relationship between any two fields. So in this case, we could do the horizontal magnetic fields related to the horizontal electric fields, and that transfer function is really something called the impedance matrix. It's a two by two matrix that looks something like this. And it says that the electric field in the x direction depends upon this component here in the uh, hx, as well as this product in hy. So it tells you how, it just tells you how things are related. But clearly, how things are related also depends upon like what the electrical conductivity structure is. So the information about conductivity is somehow buried in these guys. So the question, Yes. Yeah. see a remote uh, X and Y electrical, uh, so magnetic field, is this for reference? That's correct. Um, there's, generally you'll have a remote uh, reference station that records the magnetic fields, and, and we use those in trying to develop this impedance tensor element because we need to we need to get these guys. In fact, the next um, no, I'll, I'll come to that in, in just a minute. First of all, I, I just want to talk just a little bit about this impedance tensor business. <coughs> Electromagnetics 
it actually depends a lot on you know which uh, which way the electric field is impinging on, on a boundary. So I think it's the same in seismic where you have P waves and S waves. You know, depending on how you know which component is crossing a boundary, things behave a bit differently. We have an electromagnetic, let's call it a TE mode, where the electric field is parallel to an interface, and a TM mode in which the electric or the magnetic field is parallel to an, an interface. So those are two modes, and in this one, the electric field is actually crossing an interface. That'll turn out to be. If we have a homogeneous half space, then the impedance like, is given by essentially the ratio of EX upon HY. And here's the important formula. If we square the impedance and divide by this, we actually get out the resistivity. So we always need to have some way of kind of going from whatever value we're measuring to resistivity. And this is a formula that allows us to do it, just the same as we did in the DC resistivity one. Impedes is complex quantity, so there's also phase. So here's how things work in one dimension. In one dimension, our impedance matrix is just got off diagonal elements that, that are the same. And we can take that impedance and generate this thing called the apparent resistivity using that particular form. So imagine we've got this. We've got a three layer, 100 ohmmeter, over 10, over 500. And now we're going to look to see what this apparent resistivity is as a function of frequency. So in this case, we're going to have high frequency here. And the reason for that is that high frequencies have a very small skin depth. So this must be related to the near surface of the Earth. And as we go down, we're going to see deeper in the depth. So look what happens. At very high frequencies, the apparent resistivity is 100 ohm meters, which is exactly what this is. As we go down and make it lower frequency, we start to see this layer here, this 10 ohm meter, and the curve dips down. It doesn't quite get to 10, but it goes down. And then, as really much longer periods, it goes up, being affected mostly by this 500 ohm meter background. So the apparent resistivity, just even looking at this, kind of tells you, like, okay, here's, here's 100 ohm meter half space at the surface, gets more conductive, then it gets more resistive. So it's, that's, that's kind of nice. For 1D phone, that's quite nice. We have an app that uh, could be used to, to, to look at that, uh, play around with different parameters. In 2D, things are just a bit more complicated, and we have to kind of worry about these, th these two modes. The first is the TE mode in which the electric field is parallel to the spotter. So what we've got is a layer that's 100 ohm meters here, and that goes to 10 ohm meters. So we're going to do a, tr a transect across here and look at the, uh, at, at the apparent resistivity. And the apparent resistivity does something like this, which is kind of nice. So over here, it's 100 ohm meters. Over here, it's about 10. So that's good, doing things that, that, that we want. What happens if we're going to do the other mode in which the electric field is crossing? Well, now things get more complicated. Remember, if, so if we have currents that are going across a region, in which there's a conductivity contrast, then we're going to get uh, charge buildup and uh, discontinuity in the electric field. And you can see that here. So now if we have the electric field going this way, then uh, the electric field looks like this. And the apparent resistivity takes this funny looking thing. So that's, that's interesting, right? So it, it, you have the same structure, but just depending upon which way, so if the lightning strike was over there, or it was over here, you'd actually get two different apparent resistivity profiles. Uh, if it's in 3D, it's 
like a lot of other things, there's no symmetry, no special conditions. You just have to work with it in, uh, in 3D. Uh, just now back to a quick comment about the remote reference. How, how do you go from the data? So what do you do for the data? You're just, you're just putting out, say, some probes. You're just measuring the electric field as a function of time. So like this, right? So here's E field, here's B field. And they're all coming. This is superposition of a whole bunch of sources here and there. I mean, it's just a mishmash. What you really want to do is get something as a function of frequency, but you can't just take a Fourier transform of that. That's just not going to work because you've got a whole bunch of different sources in there. So what you do is take your time, your very long time series, divide it up into a whole bunch of windows, take Fourier transforms of each of those, and here's where that remote reference comes in. Uh, you do some stochastic averaging, and then you get out an impedance that says, on average, this is going to be the relationship between my horizontal magnetic fields and my <laughs> So there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. We don't, it's way too late in the afternoon to do that. But that's, that's kind of the idea. And the reason for that is that you're hoping that the noise at the remote reference is not correlated with the noise that you're having locally. That's the big issue. Once you do that, then you just increase your signal to Inverting the data, it's the same as in control source. Uh, the one problem that arises is you really don't know what the boundary conditions are. And uh, that causes a bit of uh, extra work to be done just to make sure that they're not, uh, that's not problematic. But otherwise, it's the same as inverting uh, CSE data. You have a question. Yeah. So going back to your previous slide there. So. Because I'm sure this 90 kilohertz survey, I mean, if you cover a large area, it would probably last for days, right? I mean, you don't do this kind of survey in an afternoon. You probably have to run a couple of days to get the survey, right? Done? Yeah. Uh, depends what frequencies you, you want to get. So, so if it takes a couple of days to run your survey, or even say in worst case scenario, a week. Okay. So your base station is going to be important because if you have certain activities in the sun, you know, suddenly you have an increase in. Um, ground currents or whatever because you know we have uh, activity in the sun and you'll still be able to calibrate it back to what you when you started say so you start on Monday Tuesday you know you get the, you know, a very quiet sun you run the survey but you carry on to Thursday Friday and then the sun is just acting up so basically creating a higher noise level but because you're calibrating it back calibrating back to the, to the baseline I'm sorry to the remote site then you'll be able, then you'll compare back all that data along the same standard or the same reference, right? The the, the the Fourier transforms that are done for the remote reference are, would have the same time windows as these, right? And then what you're what you're really asking for is sort of localized, is the localized noise uh, independent at the two locations. Okay. And that's, that's really what your, that's really what your hope is. For, if you've got large scale induction, that's actually signal. So you, that, that's, that's going to be good. So it's just, it's just a question of, okay, is the noise that's going on in this particular time window at this station, is that uncorrelated with the noise here? If it is, you're good to go. If there is a correlation, then that's actually going to come in and do something. But it's, it's much better than just using the local, the local station, which was done for many, many years, and then you realize, like, okay, these impedance estimates are actually biased. But now, if you use a remote, that really helped clean up the data. So therefore, in your better data. Your better, your better maintenance delivery data or MT data is when you do have um, a storm, when you do have, say, a solar storm, you get more signal into yes. the ground. Yeah. So, therefore, you're more likely to capture better profile in terms of your resistivity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, when you got lots of lightning strikes going around, we've got <coughs> solar activity, uh, that's, th those are the times you get really good signal to noise. Sometimes, if things are just too quiet, you can't do it. 
and that, that happens. Could you actually go rushing out in a lightning storm to run these surveys? No, you probably don't. If you see the lightning, I don't think you want to be there. But you know, if there, if there is a lot of activity that's that, that's going around, then uh, and that's actually for the higher frequencies. That's like for ten hertz to above. For lower frequencies, you know, like one hertz and below, then it's more the ionospheric stuff that's important. And sometimes there's just simply solar quiet times, and there's just no energy. And these guys are out there, you know, like waiting, you know, kind of please somebody do something. So to come back to your example with the higher um, megacaloric energy input, say from you know uh, a solar storm or whatever, so you're gaining better depth of investigation. That's what you're saying, right? You better better resolution, better depth of investigation than a than a quiet period of time, right? Uh, yes, probably, because the the more signal that you think got. The more stable these estimates say, so they're always averaging, right? So you're, you're, you're so you're averaging now, then you're averaging again and again and again, and there's some sort of variance that's associated with that. So you, you keep stacking until that fluctuation gets to be small enough, and then you say, oh, okay, that one's that one's good enough. So that you need say you need signal. To, Get that. And where normally is your signal in that? Is it usually a 1 to 20 hertz, or where's your kind of your data signal normally lies in those cases? Well, there is a band that's actually about 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz that's kind of, it's, it's called a dead band because there's, there's perennially less energy. And that comes about because there's the lightning, right, which has got high frequencies, but that kind of falls off. At low frequency, and then you got the ionospheric stuff, which is really good at low frequencies, but kind of falls off at higher frequencies. So there's a little bit of a notch in there that sometimes makes it difficult, which is why then people went to something called control source MT or C S A M T, where they'll often just put out a long wire, okay, and then just you just measure the fields and you treat them as MT signals. We actually have an example. For, for so I just show you a quick case history, and then we'll break probably. Uh, this is a geothermal case history for, for Iceland. Um, so Iceland sits right on, uh, on the mid Atlantic Ridge, right? So plates are pulling apart, you've got lava coming up, there's a lot of uh, geothermal energy, a lot of hot spots, and they get a substantial amount of power from uh, geothermal energy. With, uh, with with everything that's that we do when we come to try to uh, understand the usefulness of the EM technique, we need to have some kind of a geologic representation for the uh, geothermal region. This is basically the uh, the characteristic diagram that we're looking for, and here's how it's all kind of put together. Uh, first of all, we've got to have a magmatic heat source. Uh, and if we get water that's kind of percolating through, we get these alterations. So, so this gives rise to a clay called smectite. And the end result is something that looks like this. We've got a resistive upper surface region. We've got the smectite clay. And then there's basically a resistive core. It's kind of like a host material. And then there's regions in here that there's a lot of extra circulation, hydrothermal circulation. And those tend to be lower resistivities. So the upshot is that we're going to look for something that looks like this, where we've got kind of a conductive region in here, up top. And then the reservoir must lie below. So it's in this region below here, and it's going to lie in a region that's uh, water of use is different. So the experiment's going to be done as an MT experiment. Uh, this one used 133 stations, wide frequency range, 300 hertz to a plumb of 1,000 hertz. And there's a remote reference, a couple of farmers there. I just want to concentrate on, three, on two sites. So there's a site one and site three. 
And here's the site one. And here's the apparent resistivity. So the red is like the ZXY, and the blue is the YX. So here, notice right at very hot, so this is high frequency, that's low frequency. So here we're looking near the surface. So first of all, we know that the red and the blue coincide. That means like, if I'm looking this way, if I'm looking this way, I'm making a difference. So it seems like, okay, that must be one dimensional. And we're at a place where that's really resistant. And then it goes down, right? So we lower resistivity, that gets conductive. And it goes resistant, conductive, and resistant. But the curves split. So that means there's something going it's, it's certainly not one dimensional, it's at least two. And the curves look like that. Okay? Fair enough. <coughs> if you go down to location three down here, look what happens. First of all, the resistivity drops way down. It's like an order of magnitude less. And the curves are split right from the get go. But they still kind of have that same structure, you know, resistive, conductive, resistive, conductive, resistive. So there's kind of similarities, but you do notice that there's uh, a lot of changes between what's happening here and what's happening. And actually, if you look at the surface, then there's a lot of uh, surface alteration, hot water, and fumaroles that are, uh, are going on here. Yeah. So things are happening at the surface, things are happening from uh, empty resistivity. So now we take those data. Now this is actually a pretty big inversion because uh, there's a lot of uh, frequencies that are used. It's, it's all 3D and uh, this was actually done by one of my graduate students, uh, Goody Rosenkar, uh, in conjunction with the University of Berkeley and uh, MIT. And, and this is the result that you get. Here's a cross-section. So what do we see? First of all, we've got this conductive layer in here, so it's red. We've got this stuff down here, so maybe that's more like a heat source. And then in here, we got blue, and then interspersed with little pieces of green. So this is resistive, and then these are you know, more conductive, so like less resistive form. So these guys actually look like they might be potential reservoirs for geothermal. If you plot it in sort of 3D and have, a, have an isosurface, see there's a kind of a, a resistive core around here, but there's a region inside here that, that has a low resistive. So the interpretation is that this conductive region here, that's that clay cap, and here's our conductor. And then this blue stuff is a resistive core, and these guys here, or perhaps the, the reservoir. So that would fit in very nicely with this geologic cartoon, right? So we've got the upper region of resistivity, we've got the clay, we've got the background resistor, we've got the reservoir in here, and we've got a magmatic source. So it's kind of a nice <coughs> so uh, how does that work in practice? So this was actually drilled. And what we're seeing here are drills, drill holes that actually have been monitored thermally. So they're color coded in terms of temperature with the magenta being high temperature. And this region in here is, is called the Henkel system. So that's a high production uh, energy system. And the other one over here is uh, also a high, high producer. So it's kind of a nice. Uh, Nice example, I think, of the of the use of uh, magnetic telurics in a larger scale uh, for geothermal energy, and especially kind of being able to uncover you know, approximate location of, of where those reservoirs. Uh, good. Okay, I think uh, that's probably uh, enough for that. We've got a couple of mineral deposits to to look at, and a few other things, but I think we'll. We'll forgo those and we'll take a quick coffee break. Can people stay a little bit later than five or everybody needs to go over five or go? Okay, so
Well, I was thinking probably 5.30. Yeah. We need to. Pardon me? Okay with me. Because I'd, I'd like to do, we'll, we'll, we'll forego the GPR, we won't do that. But the IP, I think, is probably something that should be of interest. For. And then we need to talk a little bit about the future, basically. Do it. Pardon me? Can we see GPS? Tomorrow, if you come, no problem. Uh, no, I can't. Yeah, so I, I yeah, there's, there's simply no, no time to do it, unless we omitted IP. Let's break for coffee and we'll try to figure out what to do that. What's that? Do you want to oh, just enough to stretch your legs. Ten yeah, 10 minutes. Pardon me? Yeah, I'm going to fold a little bit. I'm happy to force you to do this. It's not in the you look at But uh, anyway, I'm glad to be See, we still do we have a evaluation for sorry, he's got them. Should hand them up sooner rather than later. Yeah. Doug, do you, would you like another coffee or anything like that? No. So if you want to hit Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
this yeah. stuff. Can we do it after the future? Hi. Hi. <laughs> do you know where the tomorrow's park is? Where the tomorrow's park is? Yeah, I know I can get it.
Okay, so uh, Daniel persuaded me to, uh, to do this. So virtually everything that we have yet are things that, uh, so we've got GPR and induced polarization. Uh, we can't cover them in detail, but I think what I'll do is just kind of go through once over lightly what we've got, so at least you'll see what we have. And then for people who could come tomorrow if they want, we can go through things in a bit more detail. Because tomorrow is really a, kind of a flexible day. We do all kinds of things. So ground penetrating radar. I'm not even going to go into presentation mode. I just just so that I can save some time. But the, the motivation is really uh, well, maybe a <clears throat> I'm just going to blast through these. But the motivation is really scale. Um, if we want to have small scale archaeological structures, underground tanks, a lot of geotechnical stuff. And what you're going to see is that images actually look a lot like seismic images. So we've got a transmitter and receiver, it's all in one box. Waves go down. These are EM waves now that are, are going down and reflecting back. And the everything is governed by Maxwell's equations, but now we need to have this other term in here, this uh, electric uh, displacement. And when we do that, we end up with this uh, second order equation. This is the wave propagation term, and that turns out to be the guy that is uh, instru instrumental. So the physical property is really that dielectric constant that I had uh, talked about right at the beginning with air being 1 and water being uh, 80. And the skin depth kind of is, this is sort of what we've been working with uh, up to this point in, with the quasi-static group. Once you get into the wave equation, the skin depth uh, formula changes a little bit. It actually looks something like that. So this is skin depth as a function of uh, frequency. Uh, we've got a, there's an app. You can actually look at what the electric fields are like from, uh, from a dipole in, in whole space. And it's interesting. You, you can actually see the the whole thing propagating as, as a wave because there's there's up, there's down, there's up, there's down. There's actually a wavelength here that you can uh, you can interpret. And just to kind of so here's here's a GPR signal that's being given off. And th this stuff looks pretty familiar to you from, from seismic. You can see the primary wave field on the surface. You can see something that's, that's going down and reflecting back off and coming up. We got rate path energy and you know, here's the different rate paths that uh, that one could observe. So there's airwaves, there's reflections, there's waves that come up, get refracted off, and uh, yeah, probably different rate paths. These things should be real familiar to to you. If you do lots of repetitions, single repetition, no stacking. Your signal looks like that. Five stacks looks like twenty stacks. 
it looks like that. So increase your signal to noise by stacking. And then just as in seismic, you've got a gain function to, to apply. And so your end signals look like this. So this is this is really looking like seismic. So this is to resonate. Uh, and here's your here's your radar graph. So now we have a coincident transmitter and receiver. And watch. So now the wave path that's coming down reflects back off the object and like that. And now if you're dragging this system rock, so it's like a little common offset thing that you're just just pulling along, then uh, the result of the radar gram looks like this. So if, if I took the scale off here, I'm not sure that you'd have any uh, any sense that you're looking at a <laughs> radar signal or radar gram versus the seismic signal. But these times are in nanoseconds. And uh, your relationship between the velocity and speed of light is that the velocity of the EM wave is the speed of light divided by the square root of the dielectric constant. So if dielectric constant is 9, then this stuff is traveling at speed of light by about 3. And any reflections come up as, uh, as hyperboles. So if you're looking at interpreting radar grams, then it's, now you're back to looking at the data and just seeing what do you see from the data. In this case here, we see these hyperbolas that are, that are coming up. And so that would help locate horizontally where things are. You can look at the slopes here. That would tell you what the velocity is. So now you could do a time to depth conversion. And then you also see these reflections in here. Those turn out to be tank beds of, on which the tanks are harmful. So do you typically migrate this data or do you just look at it? Uh, sometimes, I think most times you just look at it, but sometimes you do need to migrate, especially if, you, if you're looking for uh, you know, dipping reflectors or, or something like that. But in, in cases like this... Because those are essentially just diffractions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so these, these, these would be fine. But, but sometimes they do migrate. And then GPR systems, you can have you know, common midpoint, so that the antennas can be different. Not hooked together, in which case you could do a, a common midpoint gather. Um, most of most times, you just use it in a common offset mode. You just drag things along. And here's a guy. So here's an engineer. He's, he's just working in a small. Uh, he's, he's just looking for electrical wires or something underneath here, and he can just plot it right up on the screen. <laughs> So some some examples. Uh, it it you can get reflections both from conductivity contrast as well as from uh, dielectric constant. So in this case here, what was interesting was that there was both an iron pipe uh, as well as a gas pipe, a PVC pipe, and uh, it was able to distinguish both of those. And so. It, this is a three-dimensional section, uh, two cross-cut planes, and in one case you see the, the natural gas main up here, so that's PVC, and here's a water uh, pipe down here, which is uh, iron conductor. And also use uh, GPR for inline work for for water. That's a that's a big issue. He's got the GPR system like up on on the ceiling. Oh, this is this is kind of cool, uh, and I like this for a variety of reasons. One, it's just like a really interesting technology. Uh, the other is that I think it operate, offers an inroad for the public to kind of get connected with geophysics. So, you know, people are talking more and more about uh, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. Uh, the question is, uh, can GPR play a role in that? And the answer is that uh, yeah, there's a possibility. So how does all this work? I mean, regularly a car has got just a lot of sensors on it. They're, most of them are kind of optical types of sensors, GPS and, and LiDAR. And, and all these things would work really well with good weather. But if you've got bad weather, you've got you know, rain or snow or fog or sleet or something like that, uh, you know, these sensors might not work as well. 
So you're not going to be able to see you know, the road stripes and signs and things like that. So there is the potential that another sensor could be. So what they're developing testing out, is localizing ground penetrating radar. So they mount a GPR unit underneath a truck, or a vehicle like this, and then on a clear day, you go over and you just measure your radar ground, okay, and you store it. And then on a, another day, uh, you're just going to use that reference data set and then to kind of cross-reference where, where you are. So you, you've stored the reference data set. Now you go out on a different day. You calculate your radar, get your radar gram, and you cross-correlate that with your reference data set, and you try to find where that correlation is maximum. And uh, you know, it's here, and you try to locate yourself. What's interesting in the following movie is that they're actually able to show that you've got, they can get like four, mil, or four centimeter accuracy uh, driving at 60 miles an hour. Uh, in, so that's, you know, under bad conditions. So. The other thing that I really like about this is that, you know, if, if this technology actually came about, then you, you got this, you know, the average guy in the street, he's got a sensor underneath his ground, underneath his car, and he's actually thinking about using data that's coming from inside the Earth. That's geophysics, right? And so that kind of opens up the whole scope. Like, I mean, once he thinks, oh, looking inside the Earth is actually useful to, to, to me, 
then go into a different kind of survey or a different kind of update. Like, that's an easy step. So I think from a point of view of it, people understanding or accepting certain physics, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Okay. So maybe there. So I'm also going to do the same thing with IP. So the last segment of this course was the uh, something called induced polarization. And again, I'm not going to spend very long on this, but the basics of this is that we've previously been talking about uh, electrical resistivity of a rock just being like one number. But in fact, it depends upon what frequency is, is, is going in uh, as to what you get out. And, it turns out that the electrical resistivity can actually be complex. In other words, you put a, a, a current, or you put a voltage on a rock, and then it's current, but there might be a, a phase lag of that current, so that you know the resistivity can actually uh, have kind of like an effectively real and imaginary part or amplitude and a phase, just the same as we were talking. And that actually be potentially really important in a whole bunch of studies. And they're looking at permafrost, uh, mineral applications, uh, C4 mass and sulfides, uh, groundwater, just trying to estimate hydraulic permeability, and maybe in geotechnical studies. So the, the, the aspect of IP that's, that's important here, is, is kind of as follows. Ordinarily, if the, what we talked about up to now is that the ground was sort of not chargeable, didn't have a complex resistivity. Uh, if the source current looked like this, then the voltage you have would have the same function. However, for certain materials, what we notice is that when you put the current on, the voltage initially rises, and then it just keeps going. It just keeps rising, and then eventually asymptotes. So this phenomenon was really unexplained for, for, for a number of years. Uh, when you turn it off, then it comes, goes down, and then this thing decays. So what is going on here that's causing that overvoltage? Certainly, that is a macroscopic observation, but what is actually happening is going on at a microscopic level inside the, uh, you know, in, inside the rock. And sorry, I, sorry question. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed something, um, but what we introduced at the very beginning this morning on the DC resistivity was using the same application of you know having a source pair and having a measurement pair and be able to do a survey. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between earlier this morning and this is there is this technique you put the nope. you put the actual sword the actual energy in the ground or no, nothing nothing I'll, I'll, it's show, the same? You, I'll okay. show you a set okay okay so let's let, let's just get one concept down about what what's going on and the concept is as, as follows suppose I've got uh, a poor a poor throat here so I've got fluids electric initially everything is electrically neutral and then I put on electric field. If I put on electric field, the charges, you know, this is the positive end, the charges are, positive charges are going to go this way, the negative charges are going to come this way, and they're going to try to get through, but they can't get through, they get built up, and they sort of reach an asymptotic limit. And at the end of the day, I end up with like an excess positive and negative charge. That's why it's called induced polarization. This is an electrical, like an electric dipole. So. But this is not permanent, though. Nope. This can decay after. A exactly. Day. Yeah. Exactly. So what we saw, what we saw here in the buildup, that's these. Okay. So as the charges are being built up, 
to get this over voltage. We turn this off, and then those charges decay back. So that's kind of the understanding of that. And you can think about that with the mental concept of these charges being thrown out. So things that are, are chargeable, minerals are chargeable, sulfides are really chargeable, all kinds of other rocks have various kinds of chargeability. So if we come back to come back to this and make that relationship with the uh, with, with the voltage. So we we turn the current on, initially there's a voltage rise, and then these charges build up, asymptote up, and then we turn the current off, <coughs> goes down, and then those charges that were built up, you know, just gradually decay back. So that's that's kind of an understanding of what uh, what the phenomenon is, and we call that uh, induced uh, induced polarization. The the other thing is that if we're talking about data, then anything that's connected with this decay curve here is going to be related to that induced polarization. So that gives rise to a whole variety of data measurements that you can. Uh, that you can use to concentrate on that portion of the signal. Uh, there, there's quite a few things that, quite a few ways of kind of measuring something, either in the time or the frequency. Or kind of, so the bottom line is that we can always write the IP data as some sensitivity times a, a chargeability. Uh, and that results in the following thing here. So here's here's something that we've seen before. Like this is now a uniform earth with a chargeable block. So the conductivity is the same everywhere, but that's chargeable. And I do that same experiment that I did this morning over here. And here's and I could plot the data in the same way. So I can plot a pseudo section of data. Looks like this. If I drill here. There's going to be a charge of a lot, so it's okay. But remember, pseudo section is just a plot of data. Sorry, I asked a question. So yeah. chargeability is it connect? Is it the same as conductivity? Oh. Well, no. Okay. So it's related to? Yeah. It. It. Technically, the everything is connected in the sense that you say the electrical conductivity is a complex function. So it has, uh, you know, has a value at really high frequencies, has a value at really low frequencies. Right? Uh, anything that captures the, uh, the difference between the high and low frequencies, uh, we can sort of cast off as being sort of charge ability. So in a way, Chargeability isn't really an independent physical property, uh, but it's an easy way to talk about things. It's just a feature of the complex conductivity. Yeah, because when you add the base of your presentation earlier this morning, which has similar um, kind of geometry and, and setup, was the actual the actual block itself was rather conductive, was it not? Yeah. But it may not necessarily have chargeability. That's true. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so you may have a very conductive, but very little chargeability in terms of retaining the actual charge that you induce in the subsurface. So you actually may just dissipate or not be able to retain at all. So your chargeability could actually be none. That is correct. There's two kinds of charges, okay? So I, I, I've got this object in here. I put a DC current in here. I, I have a charge, right? So there's a current going through, no question. There's, there's a negative charge and a positive charge, okay? If, in addition, this block has some chargeability, can act like a capacitor, then there is an additional charge that's built up. Okay. Okay. Earlier this morning, you were showing that was, uh, as we were flowing current on one side was positive, one side was negative, yep. that sphere. And, um, but that was just not chargeability, it was just the way that you were conducting and, and kind of pull around, you know, showing one on the other hand and then the other side, but this is a little different. That's right. So what I was talking about this morning was this guy here. So initially there's a charge that's built up so long as the current is on. Yeah. And that produces this voltage. Yeah. Right? That that voltage stays 
but then there's additional voltage that comes out if the rock is chargeable. Okay. The moment that I turn the current off, that I initially recover that DC part, the drops down. Yep. And then the those accumulated charges then decay. I see. So basically, when you bring it up to that uh, sigma, whenever. Yeah, phi sigma. So if basically its chargeability is zero, then you would just stop it just flat go, right it there. It just goes straight across, mm -hmm. and then and it turn it off, goes down, goes down, snap like to that. zero. Exactly. And that's what you had earlier this morning. In this world, it was just you had the, you had the, you had sorry, the charge on one side and the other, but you were not charging it. You were not like loading it in terms of. That's right. It wasn't acting like a capacitor. A capacitor, though. Okay. That is true. <laughs> so it's just a consequence of. The and laws of physics that require to do so. Now you're is, capturing the idea of capacitance within the actual body itself. Exactly. Okay. So now, in, in this case, the the, the background of Earth is you've got a uniform conductivity, but it's chargeable, and that gives you an apparent chargeability like that. As we saw this morning, if I now put in little blocks now here I could have graphites or, or, or clays and now again I screw up my pseudo section so I'm I can't make an interpretation from that and here is my GIF model again uniform conductivity but two chargeable blocks and a little surface layer just like that so we're in the same position as we were with DC resistivity uh, <laughs> if I looked at the pseudo section and drew a line through there uh, I would have missed my targets. So we got to invert the data. How do we do that? Well, we're going to collect the DC and IP data together, right? Because it's, it's the same experiment. I'm just measuring my voltages on the off time. And so I take the my DC voltage, the asymptotic values, and I invert them to get the electrical conductivity. That's step one. Remember I said that the effect of chargeability is kind of like changing the conductivity a little bit. So that allows us to take this conductivity model and generate a mapping to understand how to model the IP data. Remember I said the DIP, the, the chargeability, the voltage from the chargeability was equal to some matrix J times eta, which was a pseudo. So, I'm now going to use this conductivity model to get a sensitivity matrix. And now I can do a linear inverse problem to invert for chargeability. So you're doing that in two steps. So the first step two is step. the more conventional. But well, the first, first step is what you do with a DC resistivity. That's it. That's it. That's, I'm going to do a DC resistivity. Like we saw but, this morning, exactly the same idea. Exactly. It's morning. exactly it, right? right? But now in my off time, there's actually some signal there. Correct. Yes. So I'm going to try to model that. In order to do that, I actually need to use that conductivity model. And then, actually, this is this is field data. I'm, I'm, this is another data set I'm really proud of because this this was done in 1992. I believe this was one of the first 2D inversions for the DC and IP that was done for mineral exploration. It's a uh, uh, deposit in uh, Australia called the Century Deposit, and the the conductivity model is is like that. And really. What what we see is is basically overburden here in this blue stuff. What they're really interested in is mineralization, which is confined to these dash lines here, which were obtained from from drilling. And you can see that the chargeability is really associated with the mineralization zone. And even we kind of help delineate the the faulting the the geometry. But a question, though, if you're looking at the, I mean, if you go and do a survey, and you're not sure if it's, you know, you're in a situation of conventional DC, DC resistivity versus the IP, you know, polarization, and you're just not quite 100% sure. I mean, could you get confused by inverting for conductivity and just stopping there and just say, okay, these are my results, and I'm going to drill there? Or is there some clues you look in the signal that say, you know what, I think, yeah, there's definitely chargeability, we need to take this a step further. Okay, we'll see an example of, okay. of that. I mean, here, we're, we're collecting the DC and IP data together, right? Okay. So we do this, and we take, and we invert the IP data, and we get this, right? So that's like two pieces of information. 
Does but it, but you have your ISA uh, experiment, mm -hmm. not experiment, but the example earlier, yeah. which was more in a DC receivity domain, right? It was just yeah. DC, right? So, and then you show like really amazing results out of it, though. It's kind of pretty nice. But, I mean, this is real earth. So was there not any kind of a, any chargeability associated with that? There, there was, and I'll show you. Okay. So if we look at the inversion of these two sections for chargeability, then here's the block. That's what we recover. So that's great. We've got the right model at the right place. And then here, again, same kind of thing that parallels with what we saw this morning. So these chargeable blocks, we recover those. But we, so we recover the big guy, which we're interested in, as well as these little chargeable blocks. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then for this model here, we recover these two chargeable bodies. OK, so now let's go to that Mount uh, case history. So what we saw this, this morning was the DC part. We're not going to change the question and say, can a conductive and chargeable unit, which would be potential target, and they be identified with DC and IP data. Okay, so it's the same experiment, but we're just going to now look at the IP data. So if you remember what we had before, we've got these different units, right? So there was, there was some uh, volcanics, and there's some siltstones and stuff like that. And from the conductivity viewpoint, the Mount Nova horizon was a high conductivity, but not the absolute highest, this uh, breakaway shale was. For the chargeability, however, the only unit that seems to be chargeable is the mineralized unit. This is highly, uh, yeah, it's got high chargeability. Okay, so now that may be the distinguishing physical property that is of interest. Do you do that from core samples or how do you determine that? Yeah, so in, to get this sort of physical property table, they would have had to have had samples of this. And then you could do things in the lab and kind of characterize what the resistivities and chargeabilities are. So just to recap what we had for the DC resistivity, uh, we had the 3D resistivity model. So here was this big electrical conductor that was the black shale. And then there's this moderate conductor out here, which we were kind of interested in, but it wasn't diagnostic. So we now look at the IP data, and again, we have pseudo sections, and you can see there's something happening in here, but uh, that does not make a, a geologic model. So we're going to take these data, and we're going to uh, invert them. And so we do that in a two step process. Right? So we first invert for the DC resistivity data, right? Get that conductivity model, and then we calculate the sensitivities, and then we invert the IP data using those sensitivities, and we get out this 3D model of the I chargeability. So now what we're looking at is that 3D volume of chargeability, and see what happens. <laughs> Been there. So we're following the same, but look at how look at the difference that we're now seeing. And again, we're placing top and bottom. Now we're going to rotate this thing around. And we end up with this. So this is the chargeability model. So we can think about this as being effectively a different physical property. And this is what we're seeing. And we notice in particular that there's this guy here is coming in. He coincides, here is it with, kind of coincides with that conductor that's up there. And <clears throat> Here's our interpretation. So here was the resistivity, and here's the chargeability. So first of all, there's 
zone D, that's the black shale, that black shale is not supposed to be chargeable. And we notice as we come through here that it is not chargeable. So there's that black shale is not chargeable. The one that is of interest is this moderate conductivity up here, and that is chargeable from here all the way through through there. And so that <coughs> is the mineralized horizon. That's the thing that's of interest, and that's the thing that's economic. There is a chargeability region in here. We were just in Australia, and interesting we were presenting this stuff, and it turned out there's a couple of people in the audience who had worked on these data, had worked on the property, and they're still actually working on this property. And they recognize this chargeable material here. And uh, it's still of interest. They're actually going to go back one of these days and really try to drill it out and see what's, what, what's there. But this is, this is actually a really you know, big success from the point of view of electromagnetic geophysics for DC resistivity and IP. Uh, and it shows that potential for finding something that is, uh, it, it is chargeable. So Doug, in your acquisition, you're, from the sound of it, you're able to do both the DC resistivity and IP survey at the same time? Mm -hmm. and, uh, how is that being achieved? Is it because of the amount of energy you put in the ground with your electrodes, or is it just the way you do a waveform? Or, or I just I'm sorry, I'm trying to understand. Or is it exactly exact, the same effort to acquire the the uh, the DC survey and just happen to look at your measurements and then you take them out to the chargeability inversion anyway? I just want to just. I just want to understand better the piece here, because if you're going to go out there and do a survey, why not go all the way to do a chargeability inversion? If you see that, yep. that kind of you know, exactly. that kind of delay or that kind of uh, yeah, you know, the distance. Exactly, you're 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 measuring that signal anyway. Yeah, it's just a question of whether you want to use it or not, right? So you, your your experiment in the field, okay, consists of a transmit that goes on, and then it's off, yeah. right? You're sitting out here measuring your voltage. You know, you're measuring while the transmitter's on, and then you're measuring while it's off. So the acquisition is essentially unchanged. Acquisition is totally unchanged. So you're not doing anything. So DC resistivity or IP is exactly the same acquisition and recording of data. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you go, so basically you may observe or not observe in the signal, basically that decay or not, I guess. Right. But then it's up to you if you want, if you have, as you say, a, if your target has a specific attribute, and if it really is the most conductive of all your, you know, of your rocks, then you might be focusing just on the first step just to do an inversion for conductivity, right? Mm -hmm. But if, in force, as you just pointed out, if, if chargeability is a better choice, then you might want to think it to the next level. Exactly. If you see anything after you turn that transmitter off, if you if you see anything anything there, then that could be charge. You know, that's information about the chargeability. So go ahead and use it. So in your experience, is you ever to ever go and go as far as doing the full effort, or did you oh, almost always? Always. Okay. Yeah. So mineral exploration, it always would do that. Okay. Because a lot of minerals are characterized by their high heat response. And there's a, actually a lot of things uh, that are uh, characterized by induced polarization. Waste stuffs are a big item. And you know, things like permafrost, minerals, waste stuffs, I mean, just all kinds of things have this IP response. And that's why you're going to see a lot more of it this time. So anyway, that was the that was the, the success there for, for three months. Is that expensive to go take it from the first level of inversion and include the other inversion, the uh, chargeability inversion, or usually it's all in the same package? Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's kind of all in one big package, but it's certainly not expensive. All the hard work is done to do the DC resistivity inversion. Okay. Then it's the sensitivity at the last iteration of the DC inversion that's used as that mapping. Okay. Uh, 
came, so let us just wrap up with the future. So this is kind of a quick summary of where we were. We did DCP sensitivity, looked at EM fundamentals, we looked at time domain in the slopes <laughs> for groundwater. We looked at time domain EM to give you a better velocity model for uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, frequency domain EM for saltwater, grounded source time domain data for uh, the salts, uh, marine EM for the risking good look at methane hydrates, uh, Iceland for geothermal, uh, you did self-driving cars for, for, for GPR, induced polarization for uh, uh, mineral exploration. There's a couple of things we haven't uh, Talk about. We can talk about any of those tomorrow if people are interested. So, what does the future hold? Uh, maybe just briefly, and I'll maybe concentrate on those items that might be more uh, connecting to, to this audience. Uh, maybe that's the best one. I think a beer, a lot of beer, because it's been a long day. Not only for you, but also for me. <laughs> So this was, this was the goal of the, of, of the disk, I mean, try to connect all of these things. The problems, high quality data, version capabilities, web tools, let's put it all together. There's the future, monitoring, a big issue, whether it's dam integrity, slope stability, aquifers, cold seam gas, enhanced soil recovery, anytime you put sensors out, if there's a change in the electrical conductivity, you've got a potential monitoring uh, problem that you can, you can work with. So all kinds of things. This was a tailings pond in British Columbia that ruptured not too long ago. So is there any standards being developed for baseline surveying and potentially to monitor you know, things like the tailings ponds? Not that I know is far as standards, but certainly people are getting more and more into understanding, okay, what do I need to do to establish that baseline, and then how do I approach that? I'll talk a little bit about that in the kind of the SAG D example, I'll show you in a second. I, I talked a little about this when I was talking about the, the, the silk code, but these are problems that are actually really challenging. Uh, and they're becoming more and more relevant. Remember I talked about exciting the object, right? So suppose we've got something down here. So maybe it's a part of a hydrocarbon reservoir that you're trying to, to explore. Maybe you're injecting CO2, maybe it's steam that you're putting in. You want to sense this, you want to figure out where this guy is. So one way of doing that is to put down uh, you know, a long electrode and funnel current in. So we can always make use of the existing casings that exist, hook a generator up to these, and you can then think about, okay, now I'm gonna funnel the current right down here, so I'm real close to my target, so that I'm gonna excite that target better. That's the idea, it's really simple, right? Just try to get your, get your transmitter close. What makes this challenging is the, the variation of scales. First of all, on the physical scale, your pipe, is you know is, it's very small so maybe it's 10 centimeters in diameter and it's like a couple of kilometers long so you got walls on this cell that are you know just like a centimeter and you've got a couple of kilometers down and somehow you got to model that and you got to model it in the presence of not only a high conductivity so this might be 10 to the sixth this might be one millimeter. Uh, and you also have that this pipe is permeable, so you need to consider the magnetic 
uh, permeability. So there's a lot of issues that are associated with looking at where the currents are and how they're affected by the outside medium and what that medium is. So that's a, that's a lot of challenges. Also, in some of these cases, you know, you got a well pad and then you're drilling out. So you got really complicated infrastructure. How do all those things interact? And even if you hook them, the generator up to this, you've got to be sure that there's not a cable running to uh, some storage shed out here, in which case electromagnetically you light it up. So issues with respect to uh, handling scales and changes of, of physical properties. But we're getting to the point where we, we can do those kinds of things, which means that we can uh, make more use of electromagnetic fields. Also choosing the right survey for the right time. Here's a, here's a case. We published some stuff. There was a graduate uh, student, I had Sarah DeVries, who was actually working with Imperial Oil here in Calgary, and we're looking at using electromagnetics for SAG-D project. Uh, the idea there is that you, uh, you, you've got this layer of, uh, of, of bitumen. You want to put in a couple of horizontal wells one of which you put steam in, and then the, that steam uh, reduces the viscosity of the bitumen, flows down to the well below, and then you, you pump, pump it up. Okay, so you think about developing something like that, and then the question is, okay, what do you, what do you need to do? What, when, where does the electromagnetics fit in? And what kind of questions do you want to ask at different stages? The first stage might be a reconnaissance survey, just to kind of find out what the overall structure like that. So that could be a, a time domain EM survey that's that is carried out over top. Uh, the second is that okay, maybe you want to get more detailed about what the background resistivity is. So you might put on some control source uh, control sources at the surface. So we're postulating the use of you know, large scale loops, and then you could measure either at the surface or you could measure in a borehole. And since in SAG D you're required to have these observational wells, uh, it's not unrealistic to expect that you could measure electric field. And then the third is so that would be all really specifying everything for pre injection, and then you've got a monitoring array that you, you, you might have again with. You know, let's say surface loops and, and borehole receivers, and then you're interested in you know, trying to figure out where the steam fronts are, and in particular, if you can find any obstructions to that. We did some simulation uh, of this, and, and here's kind of the results. So the first is uh, you know, the, the goal was to try to find the elevation of the bottom of this conductive layer here. So that's the clear water here, and this is the Murray zone here, and you're trying to find what the elevation of, of that is as a function of distance. And here's three lines that were taken, one's over here, over here, over here. So what you're looking at here is airborne time domain data that are inverted to give you the uh, conductivity structure, and this is the interpreted line that you have at the top of the memory. That's here, here. If you put all that together and take use of the airborne EM, then this is the image that you see for the elevation of that interface. It looks like this. Okay? So Doug, is this this is a model, right? This is this is a model. This is field data. It's actually field data. Yeah. Okay. So because you mentioned this is future, but is that not currently currently being done in, in SAG-D process, or is it still in a, in a kind of exploratory phase right now? I think it's a little bit exploratory, but now maybe people are starting to do it a bit more. A bit more, okay. Yeah, and, and, and here's the reason for, for doing that, right? So here's the, uh, the elevation of that interface from the airborne data, which took a couple of days, I guess, from last. And then there was a lot of boreholes that were had been drilled, and they were used to get that that interface, and that was all then interpolated, and gives rise to this image here. 
So for what reason is it not as well accepted as it? Because I mean, that's, that, that's a really good you know, case there, but and it just because people are not familiar with the technology? I think so. Yeah, that's, the, yeah. that's why it's not as widely you know, accepted. Yeah. yeah, so being able to think about going doing a, you know, an EM survey uh, over, over region like this, and converting it and getting you know, the depth to some uh, uh, elevation of the conductive layer. <coughs> But here's all of the it's all the dots are boreholes, and that's the interpolated value from the, all the borehole data. And those two images look remarkable. So there's a lot of information. This is sort of pretty easy, inexpensive uh, first pass. So if you look at the bottom, um, you're able to measure also the devonian and conformity as well. That's right. The devonian and conformity below the McMurray. Oh, well, here? Yeah, I think it's depending where the depth is. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. This is the synthetic that, uh, that that we used. So now we take and put three steam chambers in, and there's one steam chamber that's got that's got that blocky. And if you did a cross section through here, this is what the steam looks like. So we're modeling steam as being a, a conductor. And then the transmitters were two loop of uh, two loops at the surface of the earth and electric field measurements in these observational wells. Those data were inverted and they gave images that looked like this. So this is great, right? So you're you're you've got the three steam chambers illuminated and you've even got this blockage zone. That's the synthetic data we know you know every, everything everything we're kind of control. But I think that gives a lot of reason to be optimistic that you know, maybe EM uh, types of uh, surveys, you know, as your as the object that you're looking for gets closer to the earth or to the surface, then EM plays a bigger can play a bigger role, uh, perhaps than seismic, and certainly the two cooperatively might be. So that was the second. Uh, what's the future? High quality. Data. I just came from uh, conference exploration 17, so like every 10 years, uh, and there that was the that was the talk. More data, high quality data, uh, more power. Know more about the the waveforms, filtering parameters. We just want to know the, the details, and then data collected on drones, AUVs, ROVs, and uh, all of this you know requires you know future development for modeling and. and and of course, lots of data. So you got multi component receivers, uh, lots of transmitters, high sampling rates, many different kinds of data. You know, machine learning will, will play a role. Uh, all of these things are going to come uh, very rapidly. Uh, marine EM data. I, I, I talked about this. It's it, you're going to see a lot more of it over the next decade. Not only gas hydrates, uh, but C4 massive sulfides, we talked about these big smokers coming off and giving deposits that uh, you know, that exist. Those would be mineable. And also you know, large scale tectonics where you're really trying to understand you know, what's happening in the downgoing slabs uh, at these continents. Large scale EM, I showed you the uh, MT from Australia. So some of these data have been acquired, some are being acquired, but eventually it's going to cover the whole continent. Uh, Canada and uh, United States. This is what it looks like right now. They're eventually going to fill in this hole here. As I said, one of the reasons for that was this: you need to know the electrical resistivity of the uh, of the Earth here, uh, just for those not only for this understanding structure, but also for these geomagnetic storms that, that come in. So there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Uh, USGS is spending a lot of money. And in an effort to try to nail that stuff down. Water, no question, that's going to get uh, ever more important. So finding, delineating it, aquifer monitoring, management, uh, salt water intrusions, pollutants, all of those things uh, 
going to be very much more visible. Do you think EM plays a role in uh, earthquake prediction? Mm. People have been working on that for, for ages. So far, it's pretty inconclusive, I think. For data? Maybe. No. <laughs> I, I don't rule out anything. <laughs> Sorry, just, along those lines, too, there was someone at one of the recent conferences who was presenting all their lightning strikes across continental USA. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's about in relationship to? Oh, yeah, profile. Because if you, yeah, yeah, if you, if you know where the lightning strike is, now you know where the waves are are, are coming in from. So yeah, you can actually use that almost as a kind of control source. So it, it helps you a lot with respect to understanding you know, how that source relates to the fields that you're measuring. So that, yeah, it's just like, okay, I've got a, a control source. I know exactly where that thing was. You can use that. Okay. Well, see, I thought they were actually using the lightning strikes to infer the properties of the Earth because they were saying the lightning was preferentially striking Different areas. Oh, that's a bit new to me. Uh, what I have heard is that by monitoring, you know, where the lightning strike is, so now you know the location and time of the source. Okay, that gives you a lot of information. Now you can use it more like a control source in the experiment. We talked a bit about the Electrical resistivity being uh, complex, uh, that has a lot of potential applications that are now just kind of starting to really be known. There's, there's permafrost studies, because uh, yeah, permafrost has got a electric polarization associated with it. Uh, organic materials, uh, so there's bioremediation uh, that might play a role, hydraulic permeability, knowing the imaginary part of the resistivity is related to this. And just simply characterizing materials based upon their spectral IP response. It's just another layer of information and as we're able to do better and better, uh, you know, we can get more information out. And then magnetic permeability, <coughs> uh, we haven't talked about that at all, but that's not only do things potentially magnetically permeable, but it could be as a function of frequency. So we see that a lot in soils, and we do a lot of work in unexploded organs. And uh, yeah, viscous remnant magnetization in soils is important, and maybe that also in bioremediation. Here's an example I alluded to just very briefly. Uh, has to do with kimberlites. So you know. Diamonds come up in these kimberlite pipes, so these are eruptions from the mantle. So diamond is stable at 120 kilometers, and when they, they come up, there's different kimberlite rocks that, that exist. They're often, the geometry is kind of like tooth-shaped, and uh, often a lake at the top, some sediments. Uh, work that you, a group at UBC has been doing is to uh, take the gravity, magnetics, frequency and time domain data and invert that to get physical properties like density, magnetic susceptibility, electrical conductivity, and for the first time, which Saudi has done, uh, get IP data from airborne EM. So that gives us extra information about uh, the rocks from the IP data. And here's the rock model that's obtained. So this is a geophysical rock model. So a rock one might have low density, high susceptibility, moderate conductivity, high early time chargeability, and low late time chargeability or something. Rock two has got a different combination. And then you just make you know, rock one, two, three, four, five, and you plot up these different rock units. And so here's, these are all different geophysical rocks. We don't know what they are geologically, but if you had put a drill hole through there, then you understand what the relationship is between your geophysical rock and your uh, geologic rock. The thing that's really intriguing here is here you look at the geophysical rock model. And this is a rock model obtained from drill holes, because this was an area that was extensively drilled. 
And these are the different units. So there's an HK unit, a BK unit, a PK unit, and everything. And if you just look at the geometries of these things, you see you know, the, the correlations. So that's, that's really intriguing. And all of this was done for airborne work. So if, if we could do that, and if we could do that on, on a regular basis, that might be a huge step forward from the point of view of kind of integrating geophysics with, with geology and certainly making uh, the exploration process. So is this combining the attributes in a multivariate way, or is it actually a joint kind of inversion for this property? No, it's combining them in a multivariate way. So each one was inverted separately and then took those and, and just did a basically simple classification. So the future also modeling and inversion. And here again, you know, you can see that things are uh, kind of op opening up because we now have all kinds of you know, cloud computing and high performance computers, uh, collaborative development, open source. I mean, haven't really talked very much about SimPay at this point. We'll have a little bit of uh, just discussion just while you fill out an evaluation form here just to open up and tell you kind of what's going on. But there's SIMPEG and there's other initiatives too. There's European Pi Gimlet. These are all developed in Python, but there's other languages too that are coming out that are uh, interactive and open source. Uh, modeling and version, uh, interactive computing. I, I, I talked a lot about apps. The goal was to try to show you some of those today, but uh, kind of run out of time. But the idea here is that you've got equations that look like this, these are Maxwell's equations, and you can kind of convert them to an interactive app that uh, you can ask questions and answers. We'll do a lot of this tomorrow, kind of take you through some of the apps, show you how to download them and how, you know, how, how to work with them. So get something out of that. Collaboration, can't stress this enough. The, the geophysics community is small, we're fragmented. Uh, if we can somehow work together, uh, everybody can gain. So we've developed our open source uh, work on EMGIN side, and people can collaborate through Slack, uh, Slack channels or various other. So that was it, so the, goal, the goals for the disk. I wanted to uh, kind of inspire you to use uh, electromagnetics by seeing I feel potential applications and case histories. So, build a foundation, introduce you to our open source resources, set real ex realistic expectations. And you know, again, I just can't stress this enough, just kind of promote the development of community of people to kind of work together, develop software, share, capture case histories. So our resources, um, Lindsay will talk just very briefly of about these just at the end and certainly tomorrow. Um, yeah, so we've got GSI, uh, XYZ, which basically gives you a, a front page that looks like this. So the EM stuff is in here, SIMPEG is here, and then this is geophysics for practicing geophysicists, is uh, something for non, non specialists, uh, engineers, geologists, uh, starting geophysicists. So uh, there's a lot of work that's gone to put all of this stuff together. Uh, not only Lindsay and, and Soggy and myself, but we've got a whole team back at UBC that uh, really deserves credit for putting all of this stuff together. So, uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping people can join us tomorrow. How many people can possibly make it tomorrow? You can provide it when you're done tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, so tomorrow is pretty open. Like Our goal is to kind of tailor it to be useful to wherever we are. So we can start the morning off by uh, picking up any of the things that we didn't quite get through today. There's a couple of case histories, or there's some technical stuff that we could look at a bit more. So if people are interested, we can do that. Uh, the thing that we would like to have, this was really the main goal, is to try to 
have people <coughs> who are local here tell us about the problems that you're working on. So just, we've been, as we've been going around the world, we've been talking to people, and can they just give us a short lightning talk, five minutes, a few slides. Here's, here's the problem I'm working on. Here's how EM is fitting in. This is what I want to do, this is what I can do. Discuss applicability of, of EM. So that's that's actually one of the major things that we like to do, but for that, of course, we need to have participation from local people. Uh, then we talk about Synthe. Uh, so this is our Python open source resource for computing and forward simulation and inversion. And we have some tutorials about, uh, about inversion and forward modeling and simulation. And we also have the apps. We haven't really looked at the, uh, at the apps, how to download them, how to work with them, where they are. So there's, there's actually quite a few things that uh, we could do. And especially if there's only just a few people tailored very specifically to what kinds of things you're, you're interested in. But we would like to get as many people as possible to just kind of tell us what, what you're doing. Uh, we do have a blog that I'm not sure. Has anybody looked at our blog? One? Uh, tells us something about the ineffectiveness of emails. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, that's. That's the goal for tomorrow. So, yeah, we'll start tomorrow at nine. It's in a different location. It's in a different location, which was included in the last email, but it's at Association Plus, which is six hundred uh, nine hundred six thousand. So we can send out another email. Right. So, with that, I thank you guys for, for coming. Uh, Glad you were able to attend. Uh, there's one request I have. We, we've handed out an evaluation form. I would very much appreciate if you could fill that out. And also, while you're doing that, Lindsay will just give you a bit of background about uh, how, you know how to connect up where our resources are, and uh, just in case you can't come tomorrow, at least you'll have a portal. I'll just quickly show you. So this is the address for for tomorrow. Um, so the thing that I wanted to show while we're talking about here is uh, <coughs> geosci.xyz. This is really the portal to all of the open source resources that have been developed. Um, as a part of the disk and actually as a part of uh, some just educational material and research material uh, at UBC. So there's a few different things you'll see when you come to this site. Uh, the GPG is really um, it's designed as like a web-based textbook for geophysics. Um, so we've used it, this at UBC for an introductory geophysics course that's mostly for uh, geologists and geologic engineers. So it's really like a once over lightly of all the geophysical methods. Um, it is open source and meant to be edited. So if you're teaching a course and actually want to see content added or things updated, um, that's the point. And so we're very excited about contributions to that. Uh, EM is the textbook that's been developed for the disk. Um, and so I'll take you there very quickly um, and show you two things that um, I think are worth exploring, and especially if you're not able to make it tomorrow. We'll go into these in more depth tomorrow. Um, but first off, the case histories. So these are um, write-ups of a lot of the case histories that you've seen today. Um, in addition, there's quite a few more, actually. You'll see this, this list is much more extensive than what we went through today. Uh, each of these is presented in the same seven-step framework as what Doug talked about. So starting with the setup, going through properties, et cetera. Um, most of them actually have an underlying scientific publication where like all of the details are. So this is much more of a, um, an overview and sort of high level discussion of what's going on. 
Uh, and with each of these, if you come to this page, you can see what the different applications are. So there's some for mineral exploration, there's some for hydrocarbons, um, groundwater, et cetera. So if there's something specific you're interested in and want to see that application, uh, you can have a look for that. Uh, there's pages on each of the geophysical surveys. So we go through and describe just the basic setup, like what we did for DC resistivity. We'll show you what the data looks like, some of the processing steps, um, and um, what typical inversion workflows and things like that are. Um, if you want to drill down further, we go all the way into the fundamentals. So if you want to get a handle again on what the governing equations are, what they look like, um, all of that is there. And it's again presented with a lot of the same images that you've seen. So although there's a lot of math, the point is to actually get to the images and build up the intuition that way. Uh, the page that I want to make sure you see is the apps page. Uh, so what these are, right? so there's two styles of um, open source uh, Jupyter Notebook style apps that have been developed. You can run these on the web. Uh, so the EM apps are, I'll pull this up. Uh, the EM apps are really designed to be very quick to interaction. We don't show you much code. Um, the point is to get to some slide bars and some images that you can play with. The other style there, these simulation notebooks, those actually show you all of the code. So if you would like to see how to run a forward simulation for frequency domain Maxwell's equations, that's where to look. Um, but these ones here, and we'll, we'll walk through them a bit more tomorrow, but you can run them on the web through Microsoft Azure. Uh, so they provide a cloud service where we can just basically spin up a server and um, run some simulations. So if you go there, you'll see a page that looks like this. Uh, you'll need to have an account and um, make your own copy. So the accounts are free um, with Microsoft. So here we're just going to sign in as done. And then um, make a copy of this. So you can't run it right away. You have to make your own personal copy, um, which is kind of nice, because then if you want to go in and actually make notes or anything on uh, the, the pages or the notebooks, you can do that, and they'll stay. So if you do that, you'll see there's a run button that's live. Um, so we can go in and, and click on any of these. Um, so here, just by clicking on there, we're spinning up a, a web server somewhere in the world. Um, and it will bring you to the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Jupyter, it's an interactive computing environment, um, mostly used in the Python community, but it's actually, it works for any language, um, basically. So if you want to run this, you just go to cell, uh, run all, and it's just going to go through, it's going to install the packages that you need in order to actually run these. Uh, so these are based on SimPeg, which is um, the research software that's been developed uh, primarily at UBC, uh, but it is an open source collaborative project uh, where our goal is really to actually be able to simulate and invert any type of geophysical data in a consistent way. Um, you can also access the, the um, SimPeg website from GeoSci, so you can read the documentation and see some examples. Oh, oh I just updated SimPeg. That's what I'm <clears throat> So there's something that we just updated that broke the code that I will fix tonight. <laughs> um, so I'm running it on Doug's machine um, because we've also downloaded these. And so when you actually go ahead and do that, uh, we can do the same thing as what we did before. We'll do cell uh, run all. And so what, we'll, what we have in each of these notebooks is we describe a bit of the purpose of it, so what you might want to actually explore with these. There's about 25 of them in total, uh, so you can flip through and see what the scope and, and reason for our development was. Uh, we'll give you a picture that describes the setup. So this one's a DC resistivity survey where we just have a cylinder in the subsurface. Um, and then we describe the parameters and what it is you can actually play with. So these parameters here correspond to the app that's right here. 
Um, so in this case, what we have is we've got a cylinder in a half space, and we've got a uh, dipole-dipole survey on right now, DC resistivity. Um, so if we have just a half space, this is what your potentials look like. Um, but let's maybe go ahead and put a tunnel in. And so let's make this uh, conductive, so let's maybe make it 5 millimeters. Uh, so we've got a model like this, maybe it's a little too big, uh, so we can shift the radius just a little bit. Maybe make it seven. Um, and so then we can do some things uh, like what we looked at this morning and have a look actually at the currents. Um, and so we can see here our currents are being channeled through this conductor. And we can see what the charges are doing. And so here I'm just going to look at uh, the, the charges due to the target. And so you can see we get charges building up on either side. If we instead make it a, uh, sorry, a resistive target, you can see that the charges switch sides. Uh, so this starts giving you um, a lot of different tools to actually explore with uh, some fairly simple models. Uh, so this is one of the simpler ones, but we do actually have uh, examples for EM, um, time domain, frequency domain, natural sources, and all of that. So. Uh, and we'll go through this in, in much more detail tomorrow. So that I'll just leave you with. Um, yeah, so geosci.xyz, if you're interested in um, SIPEG, there's resources to get in touch with us there. Um, all of the course material will remain up on the DISC site. And this is also where you can find the blog where we've written about um, events around the world. Uh, and so what's kind of neat about that is you actually can go in and see uh, what people have talked about in terms of applications around the world. So that's one of the things we're hoping to achieve tomorrow is get a handle on what are the problems people are working on here. Um, so for example, we were in Vienna um, and you can see that you know minerals is not really getting the radar there. That's not a problem of interest. Neither is hydrocarbons really. Um, there's a lot more geotechnical work, um, a lot more with, landslides, um, and so you can go through and have a look and see what some of the examples are that people are working on there. With that, um, yeah, are there any questions about that briefly or no, just chat, chat afterwards. So again, how many people will we have tomorrow? One, two, oh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It so it started nine. So, if there's only a couple of people, probably just have part of a day, you know, nine to nine to lunch or something like that. And just, I mean, our, our our goal is to be effective, right? So we're not going to be effective. There's nobody here, and. Uh, yeah, if if there's nobody here, we've got other things we can do too. So uh, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. So thank you. Not enough response, so we'll just cancel. Oh, we'll have we'll have three nine. That's fine. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's hardly worth it. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah so now I'm thinking of you here. So nobody else is coming. Well, it's sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I live out now. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Mm. It was really yeah, awesome. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We wanted to try your research. Yeah, okay. so, no, I think it's fabulous. I, I think it would have been great. But also, um, 
it's just well, not worth knowing Calgary. Like, if they can put together yeah. case histories, so you have to talk about it. Um, and he's actually days later, so if there's any commission and they need. But we think we would send emails around that are supposed to be distributed to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, so I'm also Yeah, so just from a practice perspective, Sunday, two days ago, the first time I heard about it. That's interesting. Like four months ago, explaining what was going on. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Because honestly, Calgary's probably got some neat examples.